And I call on Keith Brown to speak to and move the motion in his name. Uh, President Officer, I'm grateful for this opportunity today to set out for Parliament Scotland's economic strengths, our resilience to the economic challenges that we undoubtedly face, and the opportunities that we are creating to grow and strengthen our economy for the benefit of all in our society. Since coming to power, this government has supported an improvement in Scotland's economic performance during a uniquely challenging economic period dominated by the global financial crises and the UK government's austerity programme. Since 2007, over that very difficult period, the number of registered businesses has risen by 15%. Business R&D expenditure is up by over 40% in real terms. Our international exports have increased by 41%. Productivity has risen by 7.5%, whereas it stagnated at UK level, and there are over 80,000 more people in employment. Scotland's labour market has also been remarkably resilient in the face of the challenges that we have encountered. The latest statistics published this morning show that the unemployment rate continues to fall and now stands at 4%. That's a record low, with the UK at 4.6%, again stagnating at the same level as previously. So our unemployment level is below both the UK as a whole and most other OECD countries. Indeed, this is only the second quarter in the past 25 years when unemployment has been this low. Uh, today's figures... I will do. Dean Lockhart. Thank you very much. Uh, we also welcome the fall in unemployment announced today. However, like the Scottish Chamber of Commerce, we are concerned that Scotland has also experienced a significant rise in the number of people dropping out of the labour market altogether, with inactivity rates in Scotland one full percentage point above the rest of the UK. Can the Cabinet Secretary explain why inactivity levels in Scotland are increasing? Cabinet Secretary. Yes, I'm happy to do so. You'll find that much of the explanation lies in the number of uh, students going to higher education. Of course, they, by definition, are economically active, 30,000 more than there is uh, previously and at a higher level than the rest of the UK. But I'm interested that the member says that the Conservatives uh, welcome uh, these figures. I, I would quote Murdo Fraser last year around this time when he said, in fact, two years ago, the Scottish Government must explain why unemployment rates north of the border are now significantly higher than the rest of the UK. Does that mean that the UK government should now explain why the unemployment is so much higher than Scotland? It will be interesting to see if that's addressed when the Tories get the chance to speak. Uh, these encourage uh, it's 4.6 per cent, the same as it was uh, last uh, quarter. Uh, these encouraging numbers, and I know it's disappointing to the Conservatives and to the Labour Party that the numbers are so low, these encouraging numbers reflect the importance that we as a government attach to getting on with the day job of supporting our economy and creating jobs. And, presiding officer, it's these strengths that continue to make Scotland one of the most attractive locations for inward investment. The latest EY attractiveness survey shows that Scotland attracted 122 FDI projects in 2016, more than any other part of the UK outside London. And it's particularly welcome that Scotland attracted more R&D projects than anywhere else in the UK and was second only again to London in securing software projects. And all three of Scotland's largest cities, Glasgow, Edinburgh and Aberdeen, are in the UK's top 10 for numbers of FDI projects secured. Again, we wait for the uh, congratulations to those uh, people who have secured that investment by the other parties. Uh, the publication today of the Scottish Government's Chief, Exec uh, Chief Economist State of the Economy report provides a timely analysis of the economic opportunities and challenges, of course, that the Scottish economy faces. And 2016 was a challenging year for the economy, with GDP growing just 0.4% over the year and contracting marginally in the final quarter. That slowdown, as is mentioned in the Chief Economist report, principally stem from the continued challenges facing the oil and gas sector. And that's why we are continuing to support the oil and gas sector, both through the work of the Energy Jobs Task Force and by supporting innovation and ensuring that Scotland can maximise the economic opportunities that decommissioning presents. Would the Cabinet Secretary give way? I, I will do, yes. Murder Fraser. I'm grateful to the Cabinet Secretary for giving way. I think we'd all agree in this chamber we want to see more growth in the Scottish economy. When is the Scottish Government going to publish some uh, results from its Growth Commission, chaired by Andrew Wilson? Uh, that, that commission is not uh, part, uh, related to the government. It's not part of the government, so we don't report on that uh, to this chamber. President. I know that Murdo Fraser knows that, but what I don't know is why he failed to take the opportunity uh, to ask the UK government to explain why their unemployment figures are so much worse than Scotland. That's the first chance he's had to do it and failed uh, already. 
Uh, the publication, as I say, of the uh, Chief Economist report does point to the challenges faced by the oil and gas sector. That's why we're continuing to support it. We're also seeing encouraging signs that conditions are improving for oil and gas companies. Yesterday's survey by the Aberdeen and Grampian Chamber of Commerce Oil and Gas Survey shows confidence is rising amongst North Sea oil and gas firms and now stands at its highest level since 2013. The recent Bank of Scotland PMI for May signalled growth across manufacturing and services sectors. However, it's clear that the UK itself is facing economic challenges and UK GDP growth in the first quarter of this year was lower than any other country in the EU at 0.2%. And rising inflation is squeezing household incomes. These pressures are particularly acute for families being hit by the UK government's benefit freeze. So it's also time to look again at the pay restraint faced by the public sector. I recognise that pay restraint has been hard for public sector workers. It's been in place at a time of UK government imposed austerity in order to protect jobs and public services. However, at a time of rising inflation, the Tories failing to control inflation, failing to uh, control debt with adding £100 billion to debt every year since he took office, it's quite clear that restraint is putting pressure uh, on uh, public pay. So we'll take a fresh look at next year's pay policy in order to address that issue. And of course, we must ensure that pay rises are affordable now and in the future, but they must also reflect the real life circumstances people face. Uh, that brings me, presiding officer, onto the main risk facing Scotland's economy. The UK government's continued determination to impose a hard Brexit on Scotland. And I'd particularly like to reflect today on the significant contribution that the European structural funds and European territorial cooperation make to Scotland's economy. European structural funds programmes are worth around £828 million to Scotland over the period 2014 to 2020. That is a very significant investment at a time when public sector budgets are under pressure. To date, over 200 projects have been approved, committing over £383 million of European structural funds across Scotland to boost, boost SME growth, as well as to support innovation and skills and reduce poverty and social exclusion. And I'm pleased to have been able to make a number of announcements over the last year, including an investment in the £250 million SME Holding Fund, which is projected to support innovation in 500 businesses and to create 2,000 jobs. Alongside this, the European territorial cooperation activities complement and strengthen the investments made through structural funds to support growth and jobs in Scotland and across Europe. Many organisations in Scotland benefit from working on projects with organisations from different countries uh, to tackle common challenges and develop shared opportunities. And those include the 3.2 million euro award to the 4C project led by the European Marine Energy Centre in Orkney to develop uh, ocean energy technology. And the 3.5 million euro award to allow our enterprise agencies to work alongside Invest NI and Intertrade Ireland to support innovation cooperation between SMEs and research institutions. And such projects demonstrate the vital role that European funding plays in supporting sustainable and inclusive growth in Scotland. That's why it's essential that the UK government commits to replacing this funding in full following Brexit. And therefore, the challenge will be, uh, especially to the Conservatives, will they guarantee that Scotland will retain the equivalent amount of money in the longer term if they are successful in dragging Scotland out of the EU? I'm sorry, I don't have much time left, uh, Mr Rennie. Uh, and uh, dragging Scotland out of the EU and the single market against the wishes of the Scottish people. So I look forward to them proving their MPs are going to work in Westminster in Scotland's interests by making that commitment on behalf of their parties here and now in this debate. And the funding provided by structural funds also complements the wider actions that we are taking to drive productivity and create opportunities for growth through investment, innovation, inclusive growth and internationalisation as set out in Scotland's economic strategy. We are making significant investments to support businesses and drive productivity growth in Scotland. For example, we are investing billions in transforming Scotland's infrastructure, which is a key driver of long-term productivity growth with many projects which have been neglected for decades under the Conservative and Labour parties. And if you don't believe me, uh, listen to Patrick McLaughlin, the Conservative Secretary of State previously for Transport, who said that that was a very problem we had in Scotland. For decades, there had not been the requisite investment in our transport infrastructure. Uh, so, so we have, uh, if you're very quick, I will do. Willie Rennie. Today, the First Minister has written to the, to the Prime Minister about Europe, saying that her support uh, for her platform on the European single market didn't garner support and a new proposal was urgently required to protect the economy and bring people together. Doesn't that also apply to independence and the SNP? Cabinet Secretary. I, I note once again that I've not mentioned independence, but again, Willie Rennie, who's utterly obsessed 
utterly obsessed, again, that seeks to mention it and try and hoover it into this uh, particular debate. But I did find it very interesting on the morning of the, uh, after the uh, election when uh, Jeremy Purvis, elected by nobody, of course, but speaking on this platform, said it was time that the SNP dropped their commitment and then was immediately asked, will you drop your commitment to another referendum and couldn't answer the question. And to ask for Christine Jardin's appalling uh, statement on uh, Sunday. But once again, what we've seen is the opposition parties utterly obsessed by independence. So to get back to the economy, which is what we should do, the funding provided by structural funds also complements the wider actions that we are taking to drive productivity, as I mentioned. The investment in infrastructure includes projects, of course, like the Queen's Ferry Crossing, the duelling of the A9, the duelling of the A96, the Aberdeen Western Peripheral Route, and, of course, the M8, M74 and M73 Improvement Project. The Scottish Growth Scheme will provide £500 million to support innovative SMEs with high growth potentials who struggle to obtain finance through conventional means. We are investing more than £1 billion in our universities this year alone and are supporting collaborations between universities and businesses through our innovation centres. Inclusive growth is at the heart of our actions to grow the economy as we equip our young people for the future. That is why we are increasing the number of modern apprenticeship opportunities to 30,000 per year by 2020 and are expanding funded childcare to improve young children's outcomes and reduce barriers to parents participating in the economy. We are also driving internationalisation by boosting Scotland's trade and international connections. Presiding officer, Scotland's economic fundamentals remain strong, but we do face economic challenges, in particular the damage that will be caused by the UK government's desire to take Scotland out of the UK and the single market. I've set out today a range of actions that we are taking to grow and strengthen our economy for the future. We have to continue to invest for growth by promoting and supporting innovation, investment and internationalisation as set out in Scotland's economic strategy. And I would urge the Chamber to support the motion in my name. And I call on Dean Lockhart to speak to and move the amendment in his name. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Government has today presented a wide-ranging motion on the economy, a subject it was curiously silent on before the election. Nonetheless, let me start with some areas of consensus. We agree there are opportunities for, for growth in Scotland's economy. We have a world-class um, workforce, world-class universities and world-class cities. And with the right government and the right policies here at Hollywood, Scotland's full economic potential could be realised. We also agree that the economy in Scotland faces a number of challenges that need to be addressed. However, in response to the government's motion, let's be clear, these challenges reach far beyond the oil and gas sector, and these challenges existed well before Brexit. In fact, under the SNP, Scotland's economy has suffered below-trend growth for the past 10 years, with average growth during their time in power being merely 0.7%. Last year, growth in Scotland was only 0.4%, while growth for the rest of the UK was almost five times faster. It's no wonder then that Ernst Young has described Scotland's economy as being stuck in the slow lane, with Scotland halfway to recession, and with e &Y also forecasting that for every year until 2020, Scotland's economy will continue to underperform the rest of the UK. Now, at this stage, the Cabinet Secretary usually intervenes to tell me that I am talking down Scotland. Let me save him the bother. I am not. I am identifying the economic challenges we face as a country. And these challenges are evident across a range of other indicators. Innovation and productivity levels continue to lag behind OECD averages. FDI jobs declined by 47% last year, despite the small increase in the number of FDI projects. And Scotland's export base is too small, according to Scottish Enterprise, with only 50 companies accounting for 50% of exports. And also, according to EY, we need to diversify our sector base, as recent economic growth in Scotland has been over-reliant on public sector construction which declined last year by 3.3%, according to the State of the Economy report issued by the Scottish Government earlier today. Although, I have to say, the construction sector has contributed a bit longer to the Scottish economy, given the delays to the Queensferry crossing. Presiding officer, despite these challenges, there are real opportunities to improve economic performance in Scotland, but only if there's a corresponding real change in the substance and the direction of economic policy in Scotland. As the Cabinet Secretary himself said in this chamber less than three months ago, the status quo will not deliver the economic step change necessary. We agree with this. 
If the Scottish Government wants to deliver this step change in the economy, it must listen to key stakeholders across Scotland who have been calling for e the economic policy to change in the following areas. First, yes, I will. Julian Martin. I'd be really interested to know what your feelings are on the post-study work visa, which is actually stopping us from recruiting people that our universities are investing in that come from other places in the world. That's something that I've certainly, when I've been speaking to university uh, leaders, has been a, a real issue. Ian Lockhart. That's something uh, we recognise as an issue, and it's something that will be involved in the Brexit negotiations going forward. Let me uh, look at the areas of policy change that stakeholders across Scotland have been calling for. First, the Scottish Government should work closer with the UK Government to capitalise on opportunities available under the UK-wide industrial strategy. For example, according to the Scotch Whisky Association, the UK industrial strategy represents an opportunity for the whisky industry to flourish, flourish as a flagship manufacturer and exporter. But the SWA goes on to say, the industrial st strategy will only serve the interests of all nations of the UK if the devolved administrations play an active role in its implementation. We agree with this. The industrial strategy can also play an active role and act as a policy framework to expand key sectors in Scotland, such as life sciences and financial technology. In the area of fintech, the UK government... Uh, let me make a bit, a bit of progress, I will later. In the area of fintech, the UK government has appointed two fintech envoys to explore how Scotland can capitalise in this critical area of the economy. With a recent report from Strathclyde Business School warning that the Scottish financial sector could face a loss of over 14,000 jobs if it fails to embrace fintech. And I look forward to the Cabinet Secretary or the Minister uh, telling us their plans for working with the UK Government on the industrial strategy. Stakeholders in the economy are also calling for a more competitive tax system in Scotland. 13 leading business organisations, uh, not, not right now, let me just finish this point. 13 leading business organisations across Scotland have called for the government to abolish the large business supplement, which affects 20,000 businesses across Scotland, penalising them with higher rates than their counterparts elsewhere in the UK. My colleagues will, will expand on this during the debate, but with this unfair tax in place, it's not surprising that the rate of shop closures in Scotland is the highest in any part of the UK. Stakeholders have also called for the Scottish Government to expand support for Scotland's exporters and boost trade with the rest of the UK. Indeed, this was one of the key findings of the Ec Economy Committee's report on the economic impact of leaving the EU. In evidence provided to the Economy Committee, we heard that Scotland's trade comprised the following. 65% of our trade is with our domestic UK market, 20% with the rest of the world, and 16% with the EU single market with the fastest growing markets over the last 10 years being trade with the rest of the UK and exports to the rest of the world. Reflecting these trading patterns, the committee heard evidence from a number of witnesses as follows. More needs to be done by the Scottish Government to support Scottish businesses in exporting across the world, including the emerging markets. Scotland's number one trading priority must always be to keep the trading relationship with the rest of the UK open and fluid. And the committee also heard evidence that Scottish business want the fullest possible access to the EU single market, and that is exactly what the UK government's objectives have been and will continue to be in the Brexit negotiations. I'll give way now. That was uh, to myself, uh, rather than Ms Martin. But uh, he, he talked about a competitive tax rate, and by that I think he means a low tax rate. Does he not accept that that would be a risk and that public services would suffer, our, education, our workforce would be less well-educated, and we would have less money for infrastructure? Dean Lockhart. What? <clears throat> don't have time to go into the Lafrica right now. However, uh, you just need to look at the high streets across Scotland to see that the, L, the large business supplement is putting businesses out of, uh, out of business. And therefore, local governments and central government is getting less, ta less tax revenue as a result of this misguided policy. The final key policy message for the government comes from the most important stakeholders of all, the people of Scotland. In last week's general election, the people of Scotland were told by the First Minister, and I quote, independence is at the heart of the election. Mm -hmm. The people of Scotland listened, they thought long and hard about this, and they voted. And the result was once again an overwhelming rejection of independence, yeah, yeah. with more than 63% of votes being cast 
for parties in support of Scotland remaining part of the UK. So it is now time for the SNP to listen to the people of Scotland and to abandon the policy that has most damaged Scotland's economy, the Scot SNP's constant campaigning for independence. Not now. Presiding officer, it is time for the SNP to remove the uncertainty of a second independence referendum and get on with the day job. I move the amendment in my name. Thank you, Anna Krill and Jackie Bailey to speak to move the motion in her name. Presiding officer, complacency and denial are the twin problems facing the SNP in relation to the economy. Complacency on the state of the economy and denial over a second independence referendum, which aside from Brexit, is the biggest threat to our economy. I see the Cabinet Secretary laughing, but perhaps he would do well to listen, because debate after debate, the opposition parties come to the chamber to hear from the Scottish Government that there is nothing wrong with the economy and what we're doing is simply talking Scotland down. And the Cabinet Secretary has recently taken to hiding behind businesses, using them as some sort of human shield so he doesn't have to answer for challenges in the economy. So let's be clear, we support business. We recognise their central role in growing the economy. The challenge, of course, is for the government to provide them with the right support at the right time. And this isn't rocket science, presiding officer. Business leaders are not shy about coming forwards and telling us what they want, whether it's the Scottish Chamber of Commerce, CBI Scotland or the Federation of Small Businesses. And they tell us they want involvement with government in setting the strategy for economic growth investing in infrastructure, maximising the opportunities for SMEs in procurement, investing in skills. None of these should come as a surprise to us. And yes, they also tell us that above all, they want certainty. And yet both governments have given them exactly the opposite. First, we have Brexit on the back of a referendum pushed by the Tories to settle their internal divisions on the European Union. And now after the general election, in complete disarray about the way forward. And then we have independence, rejected by the people of Scotland in 2014. Well, you may laugh, but I, I, would, I would suggest you listen. And rejected again one week ago in the general election. And whilst the First Minister might be in denial, and judging from the noise emanating from the back benches, the rest of the SNP are in denial, none of her cabinet have enough backbone to stand up to her, and the rest of us think she had, in a minute, think she had a calamitous election. Dropping from 50% of the vote to 36% is part of a pattern of decline. Losing the SNP majority in this parliament, staggering falls in her personal popularity, and of course, declining support for independence. We have passed peak SNP and peak Nicola Sturgeon. I will take an intervention from the Cabinet Secretary. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, just on the question of uh, last week's election, as long as the Labour Party are content to be third, with the worst result they've had since 1918, we'll be content to be first. But on the issue of unemployment, which she has failed to mention and welcome the figures today, the Labour Party, in fact, Jackie Bailey herself said 18 months ago that the SNP government had the wrong priorities. Would you agree that the Scottish Government's got the right priorities given the unemployment Sit results? Sit down a minute, Ms Bailey. There's time in hand, so I'll give you it back. Don't worry about into whether it's a speech or not. That's for me. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. I am always in your good hands. Can I say to the SNP that their priorities are entirely wrong? Anybody who can describe a loss from 50% of the vote to 36% as a victory, frankly, needs to look at doing their sums again. Because the truth is, the truth is, here is the opportunity for the SNP to put the economy first set aside the pursuit of independence, do so clearly, do so without fudging, restore business certainty. That's what our economy needs, that's what the country needs. And the truth is, there are mixed reviews about the economy. On the one hand, we do see positive statistics today on employment and unemployment, which are to be welcomed. But on the other hand, the rise in economic inactivity remains a problem that the Cabinet Secretary simply brushes aside. There are 776,000 people of working age in this category, an increase of 12,000 in the last quarter. Overall, that's 1% higher than the rest of the UK. And if confirmation is needed, look to Tony Mackay of Mackay Consulting, who points to the true level of unemployment at 4.4%, 
which is much higher than the claimant count of 2.4%. Or Professor Brian Ashcroft, who's pointed to real unemployment rising more than five years ago. Or indeed, the STUC as well, who have raised concerns before that the official statistics don't show the real condition of our jobs market. So I would suggest that the Cabinet Secretary, instead of trying to invent an explanation about students, recognise that this is not good for our economy and actually do something about it. The statistics also show that wages are declining in real terms. And with inflation rising, there is less spending power, less consumer demand, and therefore an impact on business. Not surprisingly, the Scottish Retail Consortium are concerned about the future. And not for the first time, we have called on the government to bring forward a retail strategy with the sector, and I hope the government eventually gets round to agreeing. But you know, if you want to make a real difference, a real difference to workers, and increase their spending in the economy, pay them a living wage of £10 an hour, ban zero hours contracts, provide them with the skills that businesses need for the future. In other words, invest in people to drive growth in the economy. The government's chief economist tells us that the Scottish economy grew in 2016, and yes, it did, but only by 0.4%, well down on expectations, and it's on a downward trajectory. In fact, for the last quarter, the economy shrank by 0.2%, and the fear is that we could be heading for a recession. Now, nobody wants to see that happen. But instead of rising to the challenge of reversing this trend and growing the economy, the SNP have been spending their time working on their rebuttal. So before the next quarter's G GDP stats come out, which is soon, they've shifted how they analyse this measurement so that we don't look so bad when compared to the rest of the UK, they've just simply stripped out London. Then it's all marvellous. That's the limit of the SNP's ambition. Reinterpret and spin the figures instead of focusing on growing the economy. Our economy, no, I don't have time. Our economy has lost out on money and jobs due to the SNP's mismanagement. Just look at the growth sectors that our enterprise agencies are charged with focusing on. Five out of six had not recorded any growth at all by the end of 2016. And when you compare jobs created, the rest of the UK grew jobs in those same sectors three and a half times more quickly since 2009. I see the Cabinet Secretary shaking his head, presiding officer. These are facts provided by the government's own statisticians. Absolutely. That is huge potential that we're simply not tapping into. And let me touch on foreign direct investment. The EY report notes the increase in the number of projects, which is welcome. But jobs created are much lower. The number of FDI jobs secured fell in 2016 by 47%. And let's not forget that foreign direct investment for 2014 before the last referendum slowed noticeably and companies delayed making decisions until they knew it was all over. Another reason to take IndyRef2 off the table if we want our economy to grow. Presiding officer, internationalization, innovation, investment, inclusive growth, all laudable headlines. But let me say, it takes no account, the government's strategy, no account of Brexit, no account of what they need to do to change. Fraser of Allender Institute said, it needs to be urgently reviewed. It's simply not credible to continue as normal. Let me make one final observation. No, I think you must. I've given you an extra time. Please move your amendment. OK, I will move the amendment, presiding officer, and let me say, if the SNP want the economy no, to grow... No, not let me, not let then me they say that. Should naughty, take, naughty, sit down, They should take Bailey. the independence referendum off the table. I gave you your time table. back. It's not recorded. Your microphone's off. I call on Patrick Harvey. Please, Mr Harvey, to speak to move the amendment. 6045.4 in your name. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. Seven minutes is the speaking time, is that right? Yeah, thank you. In, indeed, and a, a, a 30 second flexibility, I, and um, I will give you time. I, this I is feel, not being counted, by the way. I'll give you a little bit extra time for an intervention. I, I, feel, uh, I, I feel, Deputy Presiding Officer, that I, I must begin with an apology because in drafting an amendment for today's debate, uh, I, I regret to say I looked only at the title of the debate as it's written. Uh, and I've, I've written a, an amendment that talks about the economy rather than the constitution. Uh, the, the unspoken, unwritten title of the debate 
given the huge appetite uh, of the political parties who would like us not to talk about independence by talking about independence all the time, I, I will come to it. But I, I hope I can beg your indulgence and talk about the economy just a little bit, first of all. Um, and as is my, my normal style, I, I want to recognise some degree of agreement across all political parties. Uh, I think most of the, the party's amendments, though I'm not able to vote for either for the motion or any other amendment tonight, most of them recognise some degree of balance between opportunity and challenge in our economy. Even the Conservatives' uh, uh, amendment talks about the need for an industrial strategy, and I think it's good that our country, the UK, which went for so long with government after government taking a hands-off approach, assuming the market would fix every problem, now has some degree of consensus that at least government needs to have an industrial strategy. Uh, I'll disagree, of course, with the Conservatives about what that strategy would be, just as I'll disagree with the, the Scottish Government. Greens will continue to make the case for investment in a transition to a low-carbon economy while both the UK and Scottish governments remain unwilling so far to abandon their continued tax breaks and subsidies to the big polluters in our economy. Uh, as has been shown uh, just in the last couple of months with leaked documents from the UK government, uh, the subsidies to oil, oil, coal and gas companies since 2000 uh, amount to some £6.9 billion, pounds, most, of which, most of which is since 2010 when the Tory coalition was first formed. The Greens have advocated with our, our work on jobs in the new economy that there is far more to be gained than to be lost in the transition away from fossil fuels, but that's only going to happen if we invest in it instead of continuing to subsidise the cause of the problem. I want to agree with something in, in Labour's uh, motion as well. The commitment to a real living wage of £10 an hour, of course, Naturally, we support it. Of course we do. It was in our 2015 election manifesto, and I'm very pleased to see that it's been taken up by the Labour Party now. Uh, and as to the importance of Europe, as to the importance of Europe, uh, the SNP mentioned the uh, reference to the importance of structural funds and investment in infrastructure. Uh, Keith Brown gave a, a long list of the road building projects that he's very keen on. It's a shame that he couldn't list any sustainable infrastructure projects uh, because these are urgently needed. And the, the Lib Dem uh, motion references skills shortages. That's a real challenge in many industries, but also in our public services, which are an important part of our economy in their own right, and which also create the conditions which our whole economy depends upon. Uh, as we've just seen recently, there's been a 96% drop in the number of nurses from the rest of the EU registering to work in the UK, from 1,304 in July last year to just 46 in April. And so the, uh, the, the challenges that will come from skills shortages as a result uh, of the uh, UK government so far insisting on abandoning and scrapping the right of free movement is a huge uh, and long-lasting threat. Uh, Scottish Labour uh, quote the Fraser of Allender Institute uh, commenting that uh, uh, all of the Scottish Government's economic strategy priorities, internationalisation, innovation and so on, have been turned on their head by the decision to leave the EU. Uh, and that the previous UK administration's approach to a hard Brexit should be abandoned. And I certainly agree with that commitment. Uh, I wonder if it means, and I hope that it does, that the Labour Party now support staying inside the single market. Because the phrase that we hear so often from the Conservatives, maximum possible access to the European single market, uh, we must question once again what that phrase means. Will a worker have maximum access to the single market if they can't decide where they wish to move for work, either to or from this country? Will a family have maximum access uh, to the single market if they can't stay together and face, as so many already do, the threat of deportation. So while there are aspects of common ground and agreement across the, the whole political spectrum on some aspects, uh, I would argue that there are also critically important issues that are being missed by all other parties. The, the argument from the Greens on growth will be a familiar one to all of you. We do reject the idea that narrow metrics like GDP represent a meaningful assessment of the health of the economy. Productivity too. Yeah. 
Mike Rumbles. I'm particularly interested to find out whether the Greens think the North Sea oil and gas industry is an asset to Scotland's economy. Patrick Harvey. I would say that our over-reliance on fossil fuels that we cannot afford to burn is an incredible source of vulnerability. And if we want an area like the North East to have a prospect of a brighter future, it's about investing in the transition rather than kidding people on that business as usual will continue. Productivity has been mentioned in the SNP amendment, and Greens agree in principle. In particular, the obsession of the UK government with reducing public debt. If we do that without increasing productivity, all that will happen is that we increase the already much greater stock of private debt in the economy, which is already a bigger problem. But again, we need to consider how we measure productivity. It is quite possible that the future wave of automation may increase productivity by reducing employment or by reducing the quality of employment. And who will share in the proceeds of that increased productivity? Well, not the workers affected. Okay, in closing, Deputy Presiding Officer, on to the constitutional question that others are so keen uh, to, to discuss. I, I do need to challenge the conceit uh, of the Leave campaign that the UK can be treated as a unitary state in the Brexit process. That conceit is now being challenged and will fail. I need to challenge the idea that the UK government has any kind of mandate for a hard Brexit. They sought it and were refused it. And I challenge the idea that Scotland has consented at all to the Brexit process. It has not. So unless the UK government changes its position, we'll still be in the position that UK ministers, with the support of their new best friends among the climate deniers, creationists, misogynists and homophobes of the DUP, will negotiate a deal with the EU institutions after which every other EU member state will have its say and the outcome imposed upon us. Now, earlier this year, the Scottish Parliament voted in favour of seeking a Section 30 order to give the people who live here their own say in their future. If the UK government wants to change that position, I don't have time. The members in his last If the UK government seconds. wants to change that position, the ball is very clearly in their court. As the government, which triggered an unnecessary referendum and lost it, then triggered an unnecessary election and lost their majority, I urge them to think again, drop their plans for an extreme hard Brexit, drop their arrogant approach to imposing a deal up upon us, and work collaboratively with others in every part of these islands, most particularly with those who recognise the need to protect our place inside the single market and the rights, freedoms and social protections that gives us. I move the amendment in, amendment in my name. Thank you very much, Mr Harvey. I now call on Willie Rennie to speak to and move Amendment 6045.2. beg your pardon. Seven minutes or thereabouts, Mr Rennie. Uh, thank you, Deputy President Officer. Uh, turning away from our strong relationship with our European partners will damage our economic progress. All but a handful of MSPs agreed with that last year. Trade barriers in the form of differing regulatory systems, tariffs and workers' rights will cost jobs and growth. The Fraser of Allender Institute reckons 80,000 jobs in Scotland could be at stake because of a hard Brexit. So most agree that turning away from our neighbours would damage us. Except when it comes to England, our closest neighbour. Apparently that will have the opposite effect. It will boost trade, boost jobs and boost growth. This is curious considering the relative economic importance of the UK and Europe. Scotland's exports to the UK are worth four times as much of those to the EU. Scottish sales to England, Wales and Northern Ireland were about £50 billion in 2015, compared with about £12 billion to the EU internal market. That is, no, not, isn't it? that is the nonsense of the SNP position. They parade the value of partnership to accelerate us forward, except when it comes to the UK, who are apparently holding us back. That is the nonsense of their position. However, this should never be an either or. We should be seeking to grow both. Grow exports to the rest of the UK and to the rest of Europe. We must break down barriers, not build them up. And there is an opportunity to turn away from a damaging hard Brexit. Theresa May called the election to get an overwhelming mandate for our Brexit plan. She failed. That is why I support calls for a cross-party cabinet committee to prepare a new plan that can secure the maximum support possible across the UK. And I was interested, because I quoted it to the, 
to the Minister earlier on in the letter from the First Minister to Theresa May, which said, during the election, you sought a mandate for your proposals to leave the European single market. That proposal failed to garner support. It is now clear that a new proposal is needed urgently to protect the economy and bring people together. Now, he denied the opportunity to respond to that, because I would argue on 37% of the vote, that equally applies to the SNP and their plans for independence. But somehow there is a different standard to be applied in Scotland. Well, if he's going to answer the question now, yeah, absolutely. I'll Cabinet take. Secretary. I'll decide my own intervention, thanks very much. But can he answer the question that his colleague said it was very important as a newly elected MP that she should be allowed to continue to argue for the arguments that she put before the electorate successfully to get elected? Does that apply to all MEP, uh, MPs? The way that can intervention work... Any? The way that interventions work, when I make a point earlier on, he's supposed to reply to it, and then when I ask him to reply to it, now he's supposed to have a second chance to do that too. But he doesn't want to answer the questions that I pose to him. We are holding the government to account, and he should at least have the gracefulness to answer the question. So I'm not going to give him the gracefulness of answering his bizarre question in response. I believe our sorry, best Ms. interests sorry. are served. Mr Rennie, can I remind you either to refer to the Cabinet Secretary by name and not just by a pronoun, as that's no good for the OR. OK, thank you very much. I will do that. <laughs> I believe our best interests are served by remaining in the EU, but close observers may have noticed the Liberal Democrats didn't win the election either. We are constructive and reasonable people who will work with others on a new plan that gets all the benefits of a close relationship with our European partners, even if it is not what I would ultimately want. That is reasonable and pragmatic. What is not reasonable and pragmatic is to use Brexit for the sole purpose of winning independence. It is the latest excuse from the SNP in their relentless independence campaign. But what is absurd is that the SNP are seeking to use Europe to get an independence referendum, but cannot guarantee Europe with that independence referendum in return. We could end up not just being outside the UK, but being outside of Europe too. We would certainly be isolated then, and the voters are not buying it. If the election failed to endorse Theresa May's plan for Brexit, it certainly failed to endorse Nicola Sturgeon's plan for independence. The loss of big political creatures such as former leader Alex Salmond and the Westminster leader Angus Robertson requires an appropriate response. To carry on regardless, we'd be failing to understand what has just happened. And to paraphrase Oscar Wilde, to lose one leader may be regarded as a misfortune. To lose two looks like carelessness. And there's something very strange going on in Scottish politics and the SNP just now. Once upon a time, Alex Neil was a fundamentalist demanding independence without delay. Nicola Sturgeon was the gradualist. Now the roles are reversed. Nicola Sturgeon has gone from arch-gradualist to neo-fundamentalist in just two years. So something very strange is going on. But Nicola Sturgeon's carelessness is not just harming the SNP, it's harming the economy too. Official figures show Scotland is on the brink of a recession whilst Ernst & Young report that the Scottish economy is stuck in the slow lane. The EI Scottish Item Club has predicted below par GDP growth of 0.9% in 2017. Half of that expected for the UK. Our economy is set to lag behind the UK with consumer and company confidence falling. Employment in Scotland is also forecast to fall this year. In 2017, it is expected to drop by 0.1%, followed by further decreases in, of 0.5 and 0.3 in the following two years. Consumer spending to rise by just 1% in 2017 and by less than 1% in 2018 through to 2020. This compares with an average annual rate of 2.3% over the last five years in Scotland. Scotland today is set to be behind. Brexit affects us all, but independence and the failure of this government to perform and deliver is hitting us too. The SNP government should abandon its plans for independence yeah, yeah. and focus on what it was elected to do. Liberal Democrats have big plans to invest in our people through education and mental health. We have plans 
for a closer relationship with Europe to boost trade and jobs. We have plans that will open up and advance our country, not close it off and hold it back. Deputy President Officer, I move the amendment in my name. Thank you very much. Um, Mr Reddy, I now move to the open debate, speeches of six minutes or thereabouts. I call Ivan McKee to be followed by Liam Kerr. Mr McKee, please. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Um, I stand befo uh, before you here today as someone that's worked at the sharp end of businesses across the globe. I've seen economies boom and bust and I've witnessed the decisions of policymakers as the impact on people's lives. And because of this, and in my role as Parliamentary Liaison Officer to the Cabinet Secretary for the Economy, I know just how lucky we are to live in Scotland in one of the world's most prosperous countries. In the top 20 of OECD nations for income per head, and I recognise the responsibility we have as politicians to protect it. Scotland is lucky to have an expanding food and drink sector and a globally recognised tourism industry. We're lucky to have seen R&D investment up 41% in real terms over the last nine years. We're lucky to have world-class universities and gold standard research, even a blossoming space industry. And we're lucky to have lower unemployment and higher productivity growth than the rest of the UK. But these things did not happen by chance. They have happened because this SNP government has worked hard to ensure that Scotland's place in the world is an outward-looking international one and has ensured that the fundamental drivers of growth have been strong over the past decade. Sure. Dean Lockhart. Uh, just given the wonderful performance of the SNP government over the past decade, why has average growth been a mere 0.7% uh, during this 10-year decade when long-term growth in Scotland is about 2.5%? Ivan McKee. Well, the member will know that the uh, growth in Scotland is now, um, the, the growth in the UK is collapsing as a consequence of Brexit. That's the situation. And if you look back over the two years, 2014, 15, 15, 16, you'll see that growth per head in Scotland was actually higher than that across the UK. The reason UK growth is higher is because of immigration and significant increases in population. And if you look at the forecast as population comes down because of the Brexit policies, you'll see a collapse in UK growth going forward. So as they say in business, you make your own luck. This SNP government is committed to Scotland's economic future. Growing Scotland's economic base and business base is a key priority. We've cut taxes for business. The Small Business Bonus Scheme has saved 100,000 businesses over 1.2 billion in rates. We're supporting Scottish businesses on the international stage. The Scottish Growth Scheme providing 500 million investment guarantees for companies to grow and export more. And we've worked hard to make Scotland an attractive place to do business with record foreign direct investment into Scotland. The best performance in the UK outside of London for the fifth year running. We have grown productivity, the long-term key to economic success at four times the rate of the UK. And Scotland has the highest average pay anywhere in the UK outside of London in the South East. This SNP government is not just investing in business, we're also investing in people. We're one of the most highly educated workforces in Europe, and I'm proud that our government values education and innovation, investing one billion per year in higher education, funding research and innovation to keep our economy competitive. It's an educated population, benefits us all. But most of all, I'm proud that our government values inclusive growth, this is fundamental to our advancement as a society and, we and imperative to our economic growth. But there is no denying that there are challenging times ahead. The biggest threat to our economy right now, of course, is Brexit. And we need to do all we can to protect our economy from the insane decision of this Tory government to leave the European single market and implement a hard Brexit. Since then, inflation has risen, wages are squeezed and businesses are losing confidence. Pound fell again this week as the Prime Minister formed a coalition of chaos with the DW, DUP in the aftermath of a wholly unnecessary general election. The cracks are showing in our economy because of the reckless actions of the UK government. Applications from EU nurses to work in the UK are down significantly, storing up future problems for our public services. Today sees a publication of the latest unemployment statistics. And once again, Scotland leads the way with unemployment now down to a record beating 4%, much better than the UK's performance. And particularly pleasing is Scotland's youth unemployment rate, almost three percentage points lower than that of the UK, a consequence of the Scottish Government's focus on positive destinations for our young people. The coherent focus of the Scottish Government is on what matters, getting on with the day job, 
focusing on further improving positive destinations for our young people, delivering highly effective and targeted interventions to save and grow key sectors, while the UK Government obsesses with doing as much damage to the economy as possible through the pursuit of chaotic Brexit. Now not just hard, but shambolic as well. Presiding officer, in conclusion, these are difficult times. Uncertainty, not of our making, but created in another place, driving growth rates down and inflation up across the UK. We're at the start of a rocky ride. At some point, reality will intervene and the illusion of Fortress UK isolating itself from our European neighbours will be revealed as the economic idiocy it is. In the meantime, the Scottish Government is focused on doing what it can with the limited powers we have to protect and build Scotland's economy and to make the case strongly and coherently for Scotland's future as a European trading nation that understands the benefits membership of the single market, critical to the future success and prosperity of this country. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr McKee. I call Liam Kerr, followed by Julian Martin. Mr Kerr, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I just confirm, have I five minutes or six minutes? You, is it five minutes? Oh, it's five minutes you have, Mr Kerr. Thank Sorry. you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I thought that. Uh, two years ago, the Scottish Government set out a new economic strategy. I believe most of us in this chamber would agree with the strategy's general assessment of Scotland's economy back then. And I quote, Scotland is a wealthy and competitive economy by international standards. However, many similar-sized economies perform better not just economically, but also on measures of equality, well-being and sustainability. Two years on and little progress has been made. In fact, on many indicators, Scotland's economy has fallen further. The economy is halfway towards recession. Job creation rate is 2.7% against a UK rate of 9%. Ernst & Young forecast a year of near stagnation and below par growth. Now, as we all know, the Scottish Government will take no lessons from anyone in this chamber. So perhaps the Scottish Government should take a lesson from itself. In particular, it could revisit page 7 of the economic strategy, which states, boosting competitiveness is key to supporting long-term economic growth. I agree. So why make Scotland uncompetitive with a high-tax, low-growth economy that acts as a drag? In the shortened time allotted, I'll focus on two areas. Firstly, the Scottish Government needs to reconsider the business rate system. The current system is not fair. It is a disincentive to success. In the words of Jerry Sherder, the head of rating at property consultancy, Gerald Eve, when judged against the criteria of effectiveness, efficiency, fairness and transparency, it is clear that the business rate system is failing on all grounds. It has become a cumbersome, opaque albatross around the neck of businesses, stifling growth and placing too much of the burden on the shoulders of those who can least afford it. Oh, I know the Scottish Government has introduced the Small Business Bonus Scheme. I know this because I write to Mr Mackay almost weekly at the moment on behalf of yet another business that has pleaded with me uh, to try and get him to do something about the business rates because it made the mistake of growing too big for the exemption. A business that faces the choice when being hit by perhaps a 200% pound rates, uh, 200 rates rise of laying off a couple of staff and diminishing their offering, or even deciding it is just not worth it and closing their doors altogether. And Mr Mackay writes back to me to tell me again about the small business relief scheme, regardless of whether my constituent has any possibility of availing itself of it. Sometimes he'll tell me about capping certain industries' rates at 12.5%, but even if my business can use it, it's only for one year. It is a sticking plaster solution that does not resolve the punishingly steep increases that some businesses face. Uncertainty is the nemesis of investment. A long-term solution is needed to boost business confidence in the rate system. The Federation of Small Businesses say clearly the business rate system needs reform. And I agree. The second issue, particularly relevant to the North East, is the Land and Buildings Transaction Tax, which Bill Corbett at McEwen Fraser Legal describes as punitive. According to Retty & Co, Scotland's housing market has lost 10% of sales of homes valued at more than 425,000. Aberdeen, Aberdeenshire and Edinburgh are disproportionately affected by the Land and Buildings Transaction Tax, as the average family home typically exceeds 325,000. Savills recently showed that property sales on properties over 400,000 in Aberdeen fell by 51%. And no wonder, 
A buyer at the higher end in Scotland pays 27% more in tax than south of the border. Retired people cannot sell their large homes to downsize to something more manageable. Expanding families can't buy larger homes because they are priced out by taxes. But it doesn't even maximise tax revenues. The Scottish Property Federation found that LBTT generated revenues of 481 million uh, in 2016-17, 57 million less than originally forecast. Presiding officer, if the Scottish Government is serious about boosting economic growth, then it must design a tax system that maximises growth and maximises revenues and does not act as a drag on growth. Businesses must have confidence in the taxation system if they are to invest, innovate and cause of economic uncertainty. And the best way to do that is to shelve any plans for a second independence referendum. We have had endless referendums and elections over the last few years, and in each, the people of Scotland gave the SNP a clear message, no more. The people want the Scottish Government to focus on skills, jobs, taxation systems, and stimulating Scotland's sluggish economy. The member's winding up. Vote for the Scottish Conservative Amendment today, and let's see them do it. Thank you. Thank you. My apologies, apologies to the Chamber. I wasn't aware it's five minute speech as I am now. Uh, I call Gillian Martin to be followed by Daniel Johnson. Ms. Martin, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Scottish economy continues to be a magnet for investment from abroad. 2016 was another good year for foreign direct investment in Scotland with FDI projects at a 10 year high. And I'm proud to see that Scotland's economy continues in, to succeed in spite of the UK's austerity, UK government's austerity actions and the potentially toxic decision last year to leave the EU, which we know has impacted on the outward looking reputation of the UK across the world. The UK government continues to put political games, Brexit, the political misjudgment of a snap election just last week, ahead of what's best for the people of Scotland. But it's increasingly looking like Scotland's success in attracting foreign investment is a testament to the benefits of an altogether different approach by this government and our agencies. Now, I was particularly pleased to see in Nersen Young's uh, report that Aberdeen moved from the 10th most attractive place in the UK to the 7th most attractive place between 2016 and 17. And it, it doubled the number of FDI projects from 2015, showing the resilience of the North East economy in very testing times. Innovation in the North East has long occurred in the oil and gas industry, but it was also interesting to hear evidence yesterday in the Economy Committee from the National Grid Off-Gem Energy UK and UK Energy Research Centre on Scotland's leadership and reputation in renewable energy. From the roots of the oil and gas fields in the North Sea and our onshore gas plants, the northeast of Scotland has a strong and established supply chain and infrastructure to support a renewables industry. Renewables related research and testing at our universities and growing port infrastructure developments mean Scotland can be at the centre of the renewables industry. And as someone who lives in an area that has a very high concentration of engineering talent and resource, I'm at great pains to ask the government that we capitalise on this resource at a time when many are facing uncertainty in oil and gas as a result of the global oil price. And I'd also urge those looking at the city region deal for Aberdeen and Aberdeenshire to have procurement processes in place that favour local companies. Companies like uh, Primark Engineering, that I, Primark Welding, that I met the other uh, week when I was out campaigning, actually, um, who have long relied on oil and gas for a great deal of their business and are really needing some assistance in how to apply for contracts out with that area. And I would, I would, I would urge uh, the government to give more guidance to small and medium enterprises on how they might be able to do that because they've got transferable skills that could, uh, could, could really benefit from some guidance. Mm -hmm. The Scottish Government energy strategy lays out a, a target for powering our country by 50% renewables in the next 10 years. And we're already ahead of the game in that respect, but it's a huge area of growth. The fossil fuel future will, I think, be diverted into manufacturing and chemicals. And there won't be one thing in this chamber that's not touched by a byproduct of, of oil, and that's not going to change anytime soon. But the future of light, heat and power is with renewables, and this is an area that we can really make an impact on. Uh, in 2016, Vattenfall confirmed that it will be constructing a 300 million 11 turbine wind farm off the coast of Aberdeenshire. And this European offshore wind development um, 
Deployment Centre will be a test and demonstration facility and the largest of its, its kind in Scotland. Um, Aberdeenshire's, uh, Aberdeen and Aberdeenshire's infrastructure, port and airport and helicopter facilities make it a natural place for investment. And of course, uh, Keith Brown mentioned about the investment in the AWPR, which is going to make it even more attractive as it uh, nears its completion. Well, the renewables and oil and gas industries build on Scotland's existing strengths. I also want to consider in my last minute how we can encourage Scotland's new businesses to see investment and innovate. Business angel investment, uh, investing is one way in which this can be done. Um, it provides support for a large number of early stage and start-up businesses. However, very few business angels in Scotland are women, about 3%. Investors tend to invest in people who remind them of themselves. If the vast majority of business angels are men, the vast majority of recipients will be women. I'm sorry, that's just, just a fact. As such, when we promote growth, we should consider who is growing and who's been invested in. In these uncertain uh, economic times, we should be working to develop an inclusive and fair economy. One way of doing this would be by developing a women's business angel network, an idea that I've come across in my work with Women's Enterprise Scotland. Um, one such business that has actually benefited from angel support is uh, Leah Hutchin from Appointed, who is a West Ambassador. And she was initially supported by a Scottish Government EDGE grant. And Leah expanded our appointment booking software uh, company to a wide variety of small businesses. Um, she's now got 12 staff and is recruiting. If we take what Leah's done and we repl replicate that across a lot of other women-led businesses, we'll really be able to tap into a massive resource. I am sounding like... And there we must conclude. There we must conclude. Thank you, no, for we, must, we must conclude, sorry. That was a good example to have. But you must conclude. Daniel Johnson, please, followed by Colin Beattie. Thank you, presiding officer. Well, I think it's fair to say that this debate has been wearily familiar. From the SNP benches, we have had a story that all is rosy, and the only couple of things that are wrong are all the fault of other people. And from the Tory bench as well, we've had the Laffer curve again. Frankly, presiding officer, this debate is not good enough. The Scottish economy deserves better. We need a frank and honest assessment, because of course the government cannot control every aspect of the economy, but it must take responsibility for preparing the economy, and it must be honest about the, 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 uh, the opportunities and indeed the threats that are before us. And so it's disappointing that in his opening remarks, Keith Brown mentioned, yes, that it's right that we should celebrate that unemployment is down, but he fails to mention that inactivity is up. And yes, he's right to celebrate that productivity, but he is completely wrong to fail to mention that it's lagging the rest of the UK. And it is disgraceful that it took him a full eight minutes to talk about anything that the Scottish Government is actually doing to improve the economy, and a further ten minutes to talk about anything it's going to do in the future. It's not good enough. We need a frank assessment of Scotland's economy. And if you have that frank assessment, the conclusion is clear. Scotland's economy is not performing well. It is fragile and it lags the rest of the UK. Scottish growth is a third of that of the UK. Growth has lagged the UK in every quarter, bar one, since 2014, and we are on the edge of a technical recession. So yes, there are strengths. We have strengths in industries such as financial services and technology. But responsible government has to view our strengths and weaknesses, our opportunities and threats in the round. It is not good enough to just point to Brexit and the oil price. Brexit is only a partial explanation. That is something that affects the whole of the United Kingdom, not just Scotland. It does not explain our lag. And the crisis with the oil price has gone from being a one-off shock to a persistent and stubborn trend in the economy. And it, frankly, as the Greens have highlighted, exposes the weaknesses and the failure of the Scottish Government to pursue a diversification uh, a strategy. I'll take the intervention. Well, well, Minister. I'm grateful to the member taking intervention. He, he raises the issue about the, the uh, balance between uh, the low carbon economy and oil and gas, I think, in his last remark. Will he at least acknowledge in the energy strategy we've set out a clear role for the oil and gas industry in the low carbon transition, and we've set extremely ambitious goals for 2030 to bring 50% uh, of our energy requirements to be served by renewables? Of, Daniel course, Johnson. of course, I welcome the strategy, but as with much that we have seen since we got back to this place this time last year, we've seen strategy. We have seen objectives, we have seen goals, but very little in the way of how and implementation steps. And indeed, I think today's debate and this motion goes very much to the character of the Scottish Government. While it's willing to trumpet good news, it ignores the bad and has vague promises that will do something in the future. 
Indeed, I think this motion is something of a tale of two Ernst & Young reports. The Scottish Government is very happy to hold up the report titled Standing Strong in Uncertain Times that indeed celebrates foreign direct investment but completely fails to uh, recognise the other recently published report entitled Scotland's Stagnating Growth from the Item Club. And after 10 years of the SNP, that should come as no surprise in that they are selective in the presentation of their facts, meaning that they fail to be clear on the challenges. They are far too quick to blame others, which prevents them from being proactive on the issues that we need to face and that we should be totally unsurprised in terms of their, their being vague in setting out action and reluctant to use the powers that they have. No, thank you. And when it comes to the overarching issues that this economy faces, it is about risk and uncertainty. There is one decision that is completely within the Scottish Government's control that they could take now to de-risk the economy, and that is to rule out a second independence referendum. And, and it is ridiculous to hear speaker after speaker in the SNP to say that it's the other parties are talking. Now, maybe their televisions were off, but it was the first minister on the 13th of March who announced a second independence referendum. Maybe they've not been attention, and maybe they should be checking their phones because I think she was tweeting about it today. And the, the, the true tragedy of this is that it's not just about headline figures, it's not just about the economy, because there are key issues around underemployment, about the ability of people to advance and gain employment and work, and about in-work poverty, and a hollowing out of mid-tier, mid-wage uh, mid uh, jobs. You know, employment is down 20,000. This is the only part of the UK where economic inactivity has risen. Job-to-job -job moves, that's people getting new opportunities to work, are two-thirds the peak and below the UK average. The reality is, is that the promise of work is being undermined. Work should be able to provide security, provide your means to, to uh, provide for yourself and provide opportunity for the future. And it's this government's actions which are failing on that promise. And overarching issues are in the future. We have automation, we have increases in self-employment, and this government's inactivity is completely failing to deal with the challenges that, that, that lie ahead. But above all else, we must rule out a second independence referendum to give certainty back and stability back, which, frankly, this government is undermining with every step that it takes towards a second independence referendum. Thank you very much, Mr Johnson. I call Colin Beattie to be followed by Alison Harris. Mr Beattie, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. When we examine the current statistics surrounding Scotland's economy, we see both the strength of its foundations and the improvements made in recent years. It's true that our GDP has grown at a slower rate than the UK's as a whole, in large part due to the global slowdown in the oil and gas sector, but this is counterbalanced by continued and impressive foreign direct investment and our low unemployment rates. However, with financial uncertainty due to Brexit looming large in the near future, there is no guarantee that the situation as it stands will be spared volatility. And I'm sure my colleagues across the chamber today will agree that public sector investment can strongly enhance a country's economic performance. Such investment helps develop long-term growth, enablers such as schools, transport and communications, and plays a key part in improving quality of life. Despite cuts in Scotland's capital budget, estimated to be £600 million lower in real terms, in 2019-20 than it was a decade previously. The Scottish Government will be taking steps to maximise investment through a range of measures, including capital borrowing powers, revenue funded investment through the non-profit distributing programme, rail regulatory asset-based funding and capital receipts. This planned investment over 2015-16 and 16-17 is estimated to support over 30,000 full-time equivalent Scottish jobs in the wider economy. And this comes on top of the many projects the Scottish Government has invested in over the years prior to 2015. Many of these projects are intended to provide benefits for the whole of Scotland. The Digital Scotland Superfast Broadband Programme, for example, was one of the most ambitious infrastructure programmes undertaken by any government, and it's clearly been a tremendous success. The initial target coverage of providing fibre broadband access to 85% of premises by March 2016 was reached six months ahead of schedule, and we're on track to hitting the overall target of 95% by the end of this year. Given that more and more of our daily lives rely on some form of internet access, having a fast and reliable connection is of more importance than ever. Closer to my own constituency is the reinstatement of the Borders Railway, which has proven an outstanding success. In the six months following its opening, the railway saw almost 700,000 passengers use the service, 22% more than the original forecast. At the end of last month, a report was published by the Campaign for Borders Rail, 
examining the advantages of extending the line via Hoyt to Carlisle, and such an extension could provide innumerable benefits to those in the south of Scotland and beyond. I look forward to seeing the conclusions that arise from the Scottish Government's project review, which this report will feed into. Energy has also been an area which has benefited from investment. In 2014, the Scottish Government created an energy expert group to examine the potential for expansion of geothermal energy. As a result of this group's work, the Low Carbon Infrastructure Transition Programme invested £185,000 in four geothermal projects. And this April, it was announced that the Natural Environment Research Council are to invest in Geo Geoenergy Observatory in central Scotland that will focus on geothermal energy. Parents and children across Scotland have also benefited from investment in schools. In my constituency alone, the past few years has seen investment in new or rebuilt schools such as New Battle High in Dalkeith and primaries in Wallyford, Roslyn and Paradise in Lone Head. And beyond this, the Scottish Government has also provided £10 million to the University of Edinburgh to support construction of the Roslyn Innovation Centre at Easterbush. All these examples are before we even consider the Scottish Government's success in housing, exceeding the target of 30,000 affordable homes by late 2015. Regeneration with over £372 million directly invested in related activity up to 2015-16 and health which has seen substantial investment in a wide range of new hospitals and care projects. However, the steps proposed to, proposed to be taken in future years need to be carefully filtered through the prism of Brexit. The result of last week's general election has made it clear that voters across the UK have no interest in a hard Brexit but given the present uncertainty over who will actually be involved from the UK in the negotiations, and possibly even who the Prime Minister will be, we are no further forward to achieving clarity. What we do know is how a range of likely outcomes are expected to affect Scotland's economy. The EU market provides access to around 500 million people, with Scotland's exports now worth more than 11.6 billion annually. This equates to around 42% of our international exports. And it's estimated there are roughly 1,000 EU-owned companies in Scotland employing over 115,000 people. Approximately 173,000 EU citizens live in Scotland, providing a range of skills and expertise that helps encourage productivity growth. And regardless of the outcome of the Brexit negotiations, all of these benefits will be heavily affected one way or another. And there we must conclude. No need to turn the page. Uh, I call Alison Harris to be followed by Stuart McMillan, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. The state of the economy is rightly considered a gauge by which to rate the success or otherwise of any government. That being so, the Scottish Government clearly has nothing to crow about. It presides over an economy that is performing badly and by many factors is considered halfway to recession. Output down in the fourth quarter of 2016 by 0.2%, compared with growth of 0.7% in the rest of the UK. A flatlining economy compared to an increasing economy elsewhere in the UK. The respected Fraser of Allender Institute has said that the Scottish economy remains fragile, and Ernst and Young have said that Scotland faces a year of near stagnation. Compared to the rest of the UK... Yes. Minister? Thankful to the member for taking intervention. Would she um, agree with me that Brexit and oil and gas industry uh, troubles have had an impact on the Scottish economy, or like her colleagues, does she think that has no role whatsoever in the performance of the Scottish economy? Alison Harris. Well, whilst I think that Brexit will be challenging, I think the real threat to the Scottish economy is Indy Ref 2 and higher is. tax. So compared to the rest of the UK, Scotland has lower employment, higher economic inactivity and lower jobs growth. This is the SNP record on the economy. They may attempt to use Brexit as a fig leaf to cover their failures, but Professor Graham Roy, director of the Fraser of Allender Institute, warns against making this linkage, saying, Scotland's economic challenges and underperformance predate that vote. He continued, with any Brexit uncertainty affecting the whole UK as well, it's hard to argue that Scotland's weaker performance can be explained by the outcome of the EU referendum. So let's look at some of the real facts that are contributing to the poor growth in Scotland's economy. Failure to invest in the future. Up to 2015, the SNP have cut the number of college places by 152,000. 152,000 students that could have done much to reduce the skills gap and boost future productivity. 
Educational standards in schools are slipping backwards and Scotland is falling down the PISA rankings. The figures of the Scottish Government confirm that numeracy and literacy attainment are both down on their watch. Failing our children on the most basic level of skills, the lack of which will be a drag on economic growth in years to come. Failure to innovate, research and development funding continues to lag behind the rest of the UK. Entrepreneurial activity remains substantially below the other home nations. Scotland continues to suffer from lower productivity and we are sitting well down the rankings of innovation driven countries. As the perception has increased that the Scottish Government is more interested in the upheaval of a second referendum than in providing the basis for a successful economy, business has taken note. Ernest & Young says that Scotland is lagging behind in attracting new companies to invest and headquarter in Scotland. China and India rank amongst the UK's top, top inward investors, yet they're not even in Scotland's top 10. Ernest & Young's Scotland Attractiveness Survey 2016 reveals that only 4% of investors rank Scotland as the most attractive UK area for investment. Lloyds Bank shows that confidence among Scottish companies is at the lowest of any home nation. And to cap it all, leading investors such as Alistair Locke, chairman of the MF Group, say that until the uncertainty caused by the prospect of another referendum is cleared, he will not be investing in Scotland. And sadly, he is not alone. As well as the political uncertainty, the additional tax burden imposed by the Scottish Government will do nothing to turn around our economy. Johnson Carmichael has warned that higher taxes in Scotland could see businesses move elsewhere in the UK. And Martin Bell, head of tax at BDO, highlights that difficulty in Scottish businesses struggling in the competition to attract and retain the very best talent. Deputy Presiding Officer, the four pillars upon which the Scottish Government themselves set out their economic strategy are all based on very shaky foundations. Investment, underutilised. Innovation, lagging behind. Internationalisation, stagnating. Inclusiveness, we've stalled. The SNP Government needs to start listening to the expert, to businesses and most of all to the voters of Scotland who are demanding that they get back to the day job. The way to turn around Scotland's struggling economy is not only for the government to listen and to take proposals for a second referendum off the table, but also to recognise the need for keeping taxes in line with the rest of the UK, so as not to deter jobs and investment. A competitive economy making Scotland a more attractive destination in which to do business by improving enterprise, innovation and skills. These are the ways to increase growth and boost the economy. And there you must conclude. Thank, Thank you, you very I much. The Conservative I call Stuart McMillan to be followed by James Kelly. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Presiding Officer, uh, not only do we have the Brexit chaos and crisis and uh, the uncertainty uh, caused by uh, the, the Tories uh, and the EU referendum from last year, uh, and some of the aspects from that, uh, with the 90% reduction in EU nurses registering to work in the UK, uh, the BMA stating that 42% of doctors from the EU countries are considering leaving uh, the UK. And also we heard yesterday London uh, that's potentially going to use, lose its EU clearing role uh, facility. Uh, and that's something that would cost uh, hundreds of millions and billions of pounds every year. This highlights once again that it's, the, that it's Brexit and it's the EU chaos from Brexit and, and the crisis that's been caused by the Tories uh, in, in this uh, economic situation that not only Scotland is facing, but also the rest of the UK. And then just to top it all off, we're now going to be the Tories are now going to be marching to the beat of a DUP drum. So where's that going to lead us to in terms of the economy in the, in the months and weeks, sorry, months and years ahead? And so Alison Harris just finished off there uh, regarding uh, we should be keeping taxes in line with the UK. But I mean, I, I'm sure that other members in the chamber would probably agree with me that was this not the point of devolution? Was this not the point of actually having a Scottish Parliament? That a Scottish Parliament, irrespective as to whoever's in power, could actually do things a bit differently if they so wish. So, presiding officer, uh, but, uh, if it's brief. James uh, Kelly. Thank you. Uh, if that's the point of devolution, why didn't the SNP make the most of their powers and put taxes up for top earners to increase the Scottish budget? Stuart McMillan. Uh, if Mr Kelly wants to actually make the poorest pay, 
then that's, that's something that he has to argue. But certainly not something that, certainly not something the SNP don't want to make the poorest people in Scotland actually pay, Mr Kelly. Uh, there's another aspect, uh, another aspect to this. Presiding officer, in, in 2016, that was a record-breaking year for foreign uh, direct investment in Scotland. And the 2017 EY uh, Scotland Attractiveness Survey also shows that Scotland has retained its position as a top location in the UK outside of London for foreign direct investment. And the, this does give that clear indication that Scotland remains established as a location of choice for investors. Now, also, today's uh, excellent employment statistics uh, highlight... Uh, I'm, I've already taken one. I've only got five minutes. I'm sorry. Uh, also, today's excellent employment statistics uh, also highlight that um, unemployment in Scotland is now a 25-year low. Now, I don't think anybody in this chamber... I don't think anybody in this chamber will be complacent. There is still a lot more work to do it means a huge, a lot more work to do. But certainly the fact that Scotland attracted more R&D projects than any other UK nation or region in 2016... Just a wee minute, Mr McMillan. Could the conversation that Ms Bailey and the Cabinet Secretary are having cease? It's not very kind to Mr McMillan. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Uh, Presiding Officer, uh, Scotland attracted more R&D projects than any other UK nation or region in 2016, including London. In addition, Scotland was second only to London in securing the software projects. And all three of Scotland's largest uh, cities, Glasgow, Edinburgh and Aberdeen, are in the UK's top ten uh, for numbers of FDI projects secured. And but as I said a few moments ago, we cannot be complacent. Now, uh, there was a point that was raised uh, by it was Liam Kerr uh, when he was talking about, uh, he was talking about actually, was taxation. Uh, and uh, business rates. Now, certainly in this uh, report, Mr. Kerr, it's the Travel GBI uh, report. There's a paragraph in here that talks about the, the, this, the, the, the Conservative manifesto promises a full review of business rates with more frequent revaluations, and Labour promises a review of the entire system in the longer run. That tells me that the business rates uh, elsewhere in these islands are an absolute shambles, an absolute mess. So when it comes to the economy, Mr Kerr, I think you have to look, sorry, I think Mr Kerr has to look at his own party and the failings of his own party in power as compared to anybody else. That my, in my constituency of Greenock and Inverclyde, we have a huge opportunity in terms of tourism and growing its tourism business base, and as well as also with the marine and renewable sector. And that's certainly something that on Monday night I held a, a tourism summit uh, in the, the Beacon Arts Centre, uh, a centre that uh, certainly has been funded uh, partly by the Scottish Government as well as uh, many other folk uh, and also Inverclyde Council. But one of the aspects of this was about bringing together uh, many people, many partners, many organisations and also those who have that genuine interest because in order for the Scottish economy to continue to improve and to continue to prosper, we need to make sure we've actually got other areas uh, that, that sometimes have been considered to be not as successful and Inverclyde is certainly one of them, but need to have other areas actually stepping up to the plate. And that tourism summit is one of the ways that we will certainly improve and add to Scotland's economy. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr McMillan. I call James Kelly to be followed by John Mason. James Kelly, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. It's been a, a hectic time on the election trail and all the opponents in the Chamber have traded a lot of blows in the election debate. So... You know, this afternoon, I, I want to be helpful to the Scottish Government. Um, I mean, I've no doubt that, you know, Keith Brown, uh, you know, really does want to promote the Scottish economy and see that that economy grow from strength to strength. Uh, so I want to make some, you know, reasonable and practical suggestions. Uh, and I do want to start with the second independence referendum. If I, uh, you know, if, if I was making a speech based on narrow political advantage, I wouldn't mention the second independence referendum. And I wouldn't call for you to scrap it, because it's quite clear, you know, as each day goes by, that more and more people are becoming disillusioned by the SNP because they're, they're sticking by a second independence referendum. Sure, yeah. Keith Brown. Uh, can I just ask if James Kelly realises this is a debate on the economy and also ask if he can confirm that Labour's position is that the UK should stay in the single market? James coming, Kelly. Yeah, I'm coming on to the economy. I'm uh, f framing it along those lines because the, the reality is that the SNP are tying themselves so much in knots, you know, trying to explain the election result, trying to explain why the, the, should, the second independence referendum should be on the table that they're not able to concentrate 
on the issues that matter to people, you know, ensuring that we've got skilled workers, that we've got businesses that are growing, that we've got people that are being paid fairly. These are the key components of growing the Scottish economy. But you're not able, you're not able to concentrate on those, those issues because you are getting, as a government, you are getting distracted by the second independence referendum. So do you? Do Excuse me, could I remind members that they shouldn't be speaking to each other; they should be speaking through the chair. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. So do you do yourself a favour and, and take that off the table. I think the other thing that would be useful to do is make more use of the powers of the Parliament and increase uh, the, the Scottish budget. Uh, I understand the argument that the SNP advances that the, to an extent they are a victim of austerity from Westminster, but that is not an excuse for simply passing those cuts on to local communities. It has happened in the recent budget with £170 million pounds of cuts. If you would have made uh, full use of the powers, uh, you would have been able to alleviate those cuts. And there is good reason for doing that. I think one of the, the interesting aspects from the recent election is the debate around fair pay. You know, for example, those, and it includes people in the Scottish public se sector, who have been on a pay cap for the last eight years, have seen a situation where their wages haven't been rising by as much as inflation, and therefore uh, they're, they're poorer off. And, I mean, for example, in Scotland, we've got 467,000 people who are earning less than, than the living wage. That is not only a, a scandal, uh, it's not good. It's not good for the economy. Surely it's better to have money in the, uh, in the pockets of these workers who are in less than the living wage so that they will spend it supporting local businesses and companies uh, in their own communities rather than you know, lying in the bank accounts of people who are, are high earners that are not going to spend that money. It makes good, so as well as being fair, it makes good economic sense to give workers a pay rise, and that will actually help the economy. The final, <clears throat> the, the kind of final point I want to touch on is the other reason that you know, taxation uh, is good for the economy is it can be used to support skills and it can be used to support education. The Scottish Government got a situation where they, for example, have reduced the number of teachers by 4,000 over the last 10 years. That can only be to the detriment of the level of education that children get in their schools. And that therefore uh, undermines the ability to produce uh, kids going into key courses like, for, uh, for example, information technology uh, and engineering, which are key to the economy. So, in, in all honesty, I'm trying to give some good practical advice to the government uh, in this debate. Take NDRF2 off the table increase the budget, support fair pay, support economic growth and prioritise education and skills. I think these are good points that would help the government. I call John Mason to be followed by Gordon Lindhurst. Uh, thank you, presiding officer. I think there are a lot of positives uh, in the Scottish economy and we should not forget these. Higher GDP per head than elsewhere in the UK outside London. Exports up 41% from 2007 to 2015 foreign direct investment the highest outside of London. And if you take just one sector, like food and drink, what a real success story that has been for Scotland, with turnover now about 14.4 billion, and ambitions to double that to 30 billion by 2030. Clearly, we need to be at the higher end of the food market and in other sectors as well. And you look at our uh, fish pr production, beef, whiskey, beer, soft fruit, the list goes on. These are quality products that command a premium price and we should focus on this part of the market. Mr Whiteman. Andy Whiteman. Uh, thank you for taking an intervention. I wonder if Mr Mason regards farmed salmon as one of the foods at the higher end of the quality food market? John Mason. I think the buyers look at all Scottish salmon as being at the higher end of the, the market, but clearly there are issues in the committees that we are involved in as to how salmon are kept and that kind of thing. The SNP government has made major investments for the economy, including the new Queensferry Crossing, the M74, M73, M8 development near my constituency, 
uh, and in the field of rail, amongst others. Modern apprenticeships continue to be a success and are building towards 30,000 per year by 2020. The Small Business Bonus Scheme has also been a huge boost for business. And I was interested in the FSB briefing, which said that they reckoned one-fifth of businesses would close without the Small Business Bonus Scheme. So this government and this party are business friendly. We are aiming to get the balance right between the Conservatives, who crush ordinary people, and between Labour, who traditionally have owned everything and run everything at a loss. However, the UK is far from perfect, and one point that I think is worth raising is that the UK is far too centralised a country. Now, some people would say that London is the driver of the economy, but others have clearly said that it is a black hole which is sucking wealth out of the rest of the country. And I was a bit surprised that Jackie Bailey eh, didn't seem to acknowledge that point eh, in her statement when she was criticising eh, some of the figures we're looking at. Depends how you look at it. But I find it interesting that the SNP can be accused of centralisation when Labour and the Conservatives over many decades have failed to tackle this problem of London centralisation. On the Economy Committee, we have been doing a lot of uh, interesting work recently, and on Monday, uh, a group of us visited uh, Fife, where we saw St Andrews University at Guard Bridge, uh, with, involved in district heating system. It reminds us that the universities are a huge part of our economy, a very successful part of our economy, and they were pointing out that uh, their investments in district heating it was having both a positive impact on climate change and protecting them from volatile gas and oil prices. We also uh, went to methyl and saw that the seven megawatt wind turbine, which I think at the time was the largest in the world, and Scotland was at the forefront of this technology but did not take advantage and others have profited. And I note what the Institute of Physics says, that physics-based industries contribute £15 billion annually to the economy. And thirdly, we visited the hydrogen house which is a wind turbine producing electricity that uh, provides for eight buildings, or including East Fife Football Club, and uh, produces hydrogen for the local bin lorries. And the, the experiments they're doing that are really at cutting edge, they're finding that hybrid technology, diesel and hydrogen, is probably the best way ahead, rather than pure hydrogen. And some of these things are not commercially viable at this point, but they are an indication of what Scotland can be doing and where the Scottish economy can be going. Also in the Economy Committee, we've been looking at the gender pay gap, and hopefully we'll be publishing our report fairly soon. And this is not just so that women are treated more fairly, which is, is good in itself, obviously, but because the evidence is that the economy loses out if we are not using our workforce to its full potential. Scotland's economy can do better if we have more women in leadership positions and if more women are represented in sectors like STEM. On to Brexit. Now, Brexit has already led to a weaker pound, and we have inflation going up, probably uh, linked to that, now at 2.9%. And the dithering of the Conservative Party has certainly not helped. Now, I agree that a weak pound can give temporary boost to exports. However, in the longer term, a weak currency basically reflects a weak economy, that is, the UK economy. Brexit could also lead to skill shortage, as others have said, and there is already a real shortage of workers in some sectors, and both the economy and REC committees have heard of businesses which are highly dependent on EU workers, including agriculture, food processing, the universities and the NHS. These are key concerns for Scotland. Finally, no, I think I'm running out of time. OK, uh, support the motion. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Mason. I call Gordon Lintars to be followed by Claire Adamson. <clears throat> Deputy Presiding Officer, today's debate takes place in the Chamber of the most powerful parliament of its kind in the world. A parliament in which we can now scrutinize the use of extensive economic levers that the Scottish government has at its disposal in order to positively influence the Scottish economy. Sadly, what we have seen in recent months and years is an economy in Scotland which has been flagging in relation to the wider United Kingdom. We've already heard from other speakers this afternoon, and I shan't repeat, figures that show that Scotland's economy has been underperforming. And it has been underperforming not just relative to the UK economy in general, but in comparison to regions in England such as the Northern Powerhouse. So how do we turn this around and use the levers that we have to encourage growth in Scotland? Deputy Presiding Officer, there is much that the Scottish Government could be getting on with 
that will ensure that Scotland sends a positive message to the rest of the world that we are open for business. But it is how we approach the challenge of the coming years that will determine our success. It was Lyndon B. Johnson, I think, who said, yesterday is not ours to recover, but tomorrow is ours to win or lose. And I'll take the intervention now. Ivan McKee. Uh, thank you for taking the intervention. The member mentioned at the start that this, uh, he believed that this was the uh, most powerful uh, non-state parliament in the world. Um, can I ask him that if you look at Canada or Australia, where the state parliaments have power over regional immigration policy, does he believe that this parliament should have power over regional immigration policy? Gordon Lindhurst. No. Um, Going back to where I was, Deputy Presiding Officer, Scotland can win in the world if it seeks out positive trading relationships with partners across the globe. In the coming months and years ahead, we will no doubt continue to maintain good trade links with our European partners, for whom good relations are equally important. At the same time, the rest of the world offers significant growth potential. If we can sell brand Scotland to these places, there are few limits to our growth potential. Projected growth in the euro area this year, for instance, is expected to sit at 1.5%. Emerging and developing market growth is projected at 4.6%. But in China, the rate is expected to be 6.2%, and in India, 7.6%. But only 0.7% of our exports go to China and 0.3% to India. And with neither country having a trade agreement with the EU or, by extension, the UK, the growth potential arising from building deeper relationships with these countries could be significant for Scotland. Earlier this year, the Economy Committee heard evidence about the impact of leaving the EU, including the potential for greater trade beyond Europe. Scotland Food and Drink Limited, for example, gave evidence that there is potential for us in premium markets and tapping into consumers' desire for quality, authenticity, and provenance. I fully agree with that statement. We have a lot to be proud of in this country, and we have a global reach that is the envy of many. But we have to harness that potential, and the government needs to play its part in making sure that Scottish businesses have the help they need to increase their exports. May I suggest first that we need to ensure that we play a positive role in trade negotiations rather than a negative one that only focuses on risk. We can, uh, not at this stage, um, we can do ourselves a favor, to use a phrase of my colleague uh, earlier on in the debate, and be positive about leaving the EU and the opportunities that arise. The UK is intending to bring back power to negotiate its own trade deals. Uh, and these can be ones where our interests are not watered down or held up for years on end due to negotiation as a consequence of a complex block of 28 different countries seeking to further their own interests. Scotland will be able to have a much greater input into these deals and ensuring our voice is heard will be of paramount importance. Secondly, the Scottish Government and its agencies must do more to encourage that growth in exports. Larger companies can manage complexities, but others cannot. We must improve on our current situation. Um, I will conclude by saying, Deputy Presiding Officer, that Scotland has always been an outward-looking country. I believe that by embracing an outward-looking approach, there are many opportunities for growth presented by the circumstances we now face. The last of the open debate speakers is Claire Adamson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, this afternoon's debate... Um, has been um, varied and wondered, um, uh, certainly not just about um, Scotland's economy. And I want to touch on some of the issues that were raised in the chamber this afternoon. Um, Gillian Martin uh, challenged uh, Mr Lockhart about the post-study work visa. Um, and he said that would be something to do with Brexit negotiations. If there was anything that was not to do with Brexit negotiation, is the post-study work visa as it applies to non-EU students. We have supported that. It was introduced by Labour. We, we supported the post-study work visa because it brought such advantages to Scotland's universities. 
snatched away by a Tory government. And I would ask Mr Lockhart, Lockhart if he could, he could look, speak to the principals of Scotland's universities, explain to them why Oxford and Cambridge universities merit a special arrangement, but our universities do not, when it is so damaging to our economy that that has been taken away. I would just touch on one of the other issues that was raised this afternoon um, uh, in an intervention by Mr Wheelhouse about our um, transition to a low carbon economy. And Mr Johnson, who um, said that you know, he welcomes strategies, but he doesn't see um, any benefits of them. Well, he needs to open his eyes a bit more because only this week, Scotland met its emission reduction targets six years early. Emissions down by 46%. So our economy is working in a low carbon, working towards a low carbon economy. What a great advantage for Scotland in the world in our standings. Mr Harvey, sorry, I'm tight for time. I'm not going to take interventions this afternoon. And Scotland's economy is something we should all be proud of. The oil and gas sector is, is starting to recover and show um, a, a growth signs. The labour market has re remained resilient despite the pressures on it. It continues to be the most attractive part of the UK outside London for foreign direct investment. In the five years since 2010, Scotland's GDP growth is in line with the UK average and Scotland's GDP per head growth is above the UK average when, Scot when London is excluded. And I also want to look at some of the particular sectors and I should declare an interest as a member of the British Computer Society. But no, I'm not taking intervention, sorry. If we look to um, uh, IS Scotland, um, the um, body of the software industry in Scotland, they do a survey every year of um, the, the companies in Scotland and the most recent survey from 2016 shows that they're very positive about the way forward for software in Scotland. Um, they also show that there's now an increase in the uptake of modern apprenticeships in the IT sector, which is a fantastic route into the IT industry, um, through the, not through the more traditional routes of higher or further education. And these are to be very, very welcomed. And I want to thank Data Lab for providing the briefing that they have for today's debate. Data Lab um, has been working with companies um, and, and showing the value of big data and the Internet of Things and the, the positive um, benefits that those could build, bring to the Scottish economy. Um, and it reminded me that I had recently visited Census, one of our centres of excellence, and a place that works on the information of things as a centre of excellence in Scotland. And the Cabinet Secretary mentioned that. And it's so important that we continue to invest in these areas because Scotland is world leading in some of the IT areas, in financial tech, it's moving forward, as it's um, called BT very much talking about the life sciences and the innovations that are happening in his area too. And Scotland, so we should be very, very proud of, of the important um, benefits to Scotland that these economies bring. And um, one of the things that I'm particularly interested in uh, Mr McKee's presentation was he did talk about the productivity level in Scotland. And this is so important and touched on by many people this afternoon. Higher productivity means that we have fewer of the low value types of employment that seem to be so favoured by the UK government. It's a, 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 an economy that's productivity is, is better, which means people are being paid better. We have less um, zero hours contracts and I should also declare an interest as a real wage living employer. We also support the real living wage in Scotland, not the pretend one that was introduced by the Tory government, which doesn't meet the needs, needs of a, a modern economy. So I just want to finish by asking my colleagues on the benches, speak to their colleagues about the post-study work visa, and maybe speak to them about VAT too, because Les Cameron um, today, uh, Scottish Chamber of Commerce, is, are calling on the UK government to look at the inflationary help that could be given by a reduction of VAT, and perhaps they might also ask them if they could return the money picked from the pockets of our police and fire service when they do so. We now move to the closing speeches. Disappointing to note that not all of those who contributed are in the chamber. And can I call on Willie Rennie? Up to six minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy President Officer. There's been several revelations this afternoon in the debate. James Kelly wants to be helpful to the SNP. No. And John Mason has been to Fife and is raving about it. And so he should too. But John Mason followed that revelation with 
the other comments from the other speakers too. A lot of positives about the Scottish economy is what he said. Gillian Martin said it was a success and a magnet. Claire Adamson's just said it's world leading. Stuart McMillan talked about Scotland being record breaking. Colin Beattie did admit weaknesses but blamed someone else. John Mason again said that Scotland was the best in the UK as long as we ignored a large part of the UK. Paul Wheelhouse blamed the oil industry, the very industry that was the white paper and the independence case was based upon. So he claims all these things and, they, and it's quite right for the SNP members to be cheery, of course that's their job, but what we need to also point out is that there are some weaknesses within the economy in Scotland too, even if they choose to ignore them. The FSB's most recent quarterly business confidence index, the quarter one from 2017, published in April, no, suggested confidence in Scotland was still in negative territory, minus 9.6, and behind the UK average of plus 20. According to the Institute of Physics, Scotland currently spends around 1.4% of GDP on research and development compared with the UK average of 1.68% and spends around 0.6% of GDP on business R&D compared with the UK average of 1.11%. I mean, these are long-standing problems, but the SNP government are hardly making any difference in moving in the right direction on those areas. If Scotland wants to be the high technology, high productivity, high prosperity economy in the future, then it must tackle this stubborn performance. It has lagged behind the rest of the UK and many other modern economies for far too long. If it were not for the funding from the UK research councils, we would be even further behind. A renewed plan to boost research and development is essential, with more tax breaks and incentives for companies to invest in R&D. We need a long-term plan also to build a strong economy based on investing in the best asset that we have, the people who live and work here. And I want to make common cause with Claire Adamson on a point that she made about Scottish universities and the post-study work visa. Scottish universities have seen a 60% drop in Indian students since 2012, risking £800 million that overseas students contribute to the Scottish economy. The Scottish Government should be able to sponsor new post-study work visas. These will support Scottish universities to be the best in the world. We should guarantee the rights of EU citizens in this country. The guarantee extends to the rights of EU staff and students in our universities. St Andrews University, which John Mason had visited, it has a large proportion of its student numbers and staff members and grant um, volumes of cash coming from the European Union. That's incredibly important and is something that we should seek to protect. A transformative additional investment in education and a step change in mental health would help people achieve their potential too, and it would enable businesses to find the skills that they need. The performance of Scottish education, as we all know, has dropped down the international rankings. To get it back up to the best in the world again, we need to invest. We say a modest penny on income tax would invest £500 million in nurseries, schools and colleges. Others may have other ideas, but colleges have lost 152,000 places, especially for older people and women. Lifelong learning should be a priority again. It's been abandoned by this government. It should be a priority again and give people the skills and retraining they need for work. Schools are struggling with the OECD report, a cause for great concern. In reading, science and maths, we are falling behind other competitors in the last 10 years. The Pupil Equity Fund is six years late and falls short of the equivalent fund in England. That pupil premium in England has closed the attainment gap by five percentage points. And we need to invest in nursery education too. The best educational investment that we can make. And the signs are that the SNP government is struggling to roll out that nursery education programme. The annual survey for the nursery sector has indicated only half of the private and state nurseries plan to offer the places that are needed in order to achieve this expansion. We also want a focus on mental health, because mental health is critically important for a healthy workforce. We want a new mental health services in every GP practice, A&E department, police, division and school, and a new five-point plan 
to offer mental health support for young mothers. This is the Liberal Democrat plan to invest in people, to attract the best to our country, to generate growth and opportunity through those people. We have a plan to invest in education and mental health with that modest increase in taxation for nursery schools and colleges, a plan for mental health in all sectors of the health service. A damaging hard Brexit must be avoided by Theresa May now too. Her plan was rejected at the ballot box and she needs to revisit what she plans to do and a new cross-party approach is required. But the real threat to the Scottish economy comes from the SNP with their plans for another divisive independence referendum. Public, public opinion has swung away from the SNP and their plans for that referendum. The biggest shift in public opinion Muscles, away from please. the SNP ever deserves more than this. That is why the SNP should respond to this and cancel the referendum right now. Right now. Yeah. I call Andy Whiteman up to six minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding uh, Officer. Um, the last time I think I spoke and we spoke in a debate on the economy was on the 19th of April this year, uh, the day after the Prime Minister then called uh, a general election. And although this is a debate on the economy, it's not surprising perhaps that other parties have chosen to use this to raise questions about the Constitution. The result, in fact, of the Tories' decision to have a general election is now even greater chaos. Following the 2015 general election, when the Tories, including some members present, stood on a manifesto that promised that voters in the UK could vote Conservative and not only preserve the UK's place in the single market, but strengthen and expand that single market. The reality is it's the Conservatives that have made much of the Constitution to deflect from their own disastrous actions, first in calling a referendum uh, on the EU, and secondly, the chaos that the country now faces in the wake of the general election. And our amendment focuses solely on the economy, because that is what the motion uh, is about. Presiding officer, as members know, and as my colleague Patrick Harvey indicated at the beginning, Greens take a very different view on matters to do uh, with the economy. As highlighted in comments I made back in April, uh, our party is one uh, part of an international movement that's developed green economics over decades and which re recognises that endless growth is not possible on a finite planet. Green economics also recognises that the climate crisis is leading to growing instability, unrest and economic decline. And we also recognise that in order to keep within the Paris climate targets, we need to keep in the ground the majority of the hydrocarbons that other parties in this chamber often tout as being part of Scotland's economic uh, future. Yes, I'd be happy to take an intervention. In an obvious Mike Crumbles. I'm very keen to know, do, do the Greens consider the North Sea oil and gas industry an asset to the Scottish economy or not? Andy Whiteman. The North Sea oil and gas industry clearly have been an asset to the Scottish economy in the past, but they are not part of the future. And the faster we can transition away from a hydrocarbon economy to renewable economy, uh, the better. Now, we've also heard explanations about why GDP or gross domestic, gross domestic product figures as, are they, uh, as, are they, as, as they are in the United Kingdom and in Scotland. And it's worth highlighting that the majority of the GDP growth that we have seen across the UK is in private consumption. In March 2015, private debt stood at over £1.5 trillion. So much of the so-called growth that others welcome is in fact more debt, people buying things that they don't need with money they don't have. Now, Liam Kerr and others talked about non-domestic uh, rates, and I agree, we need reform in non-domestic rates. We need reform in a whole suite of taxes relating to land and property, and I look forward, as I'm sure Liam and other members do, to the Barclay Review reporting uh, soon uh, on this question. And I hope it questions why, for example, over 90% of land in Scotland hasn't paid any rates uh, in 50 years. I hope it questions, amongst other things, the small business bonus scheme. Back in April, I talked about its failings, or some of its uh, failings, including a small business in East Lothian, who's very happy that they're now paying no rates 
under the small business bonus scheme because of the increase in the threshold. However, the empty shop next door, the rent for that is being increased in the recognition of the fact that the occupier will no longer need to pay rates. So that occupier will be no better off as a consequence and the tax breaks have been capitalised uh, into uh, rent. We will soon publish research showing the losses running into tens of millions of pounds to councils across Scotland, particularly in Edinburgh, by the rent-seeking behaviour of landlords who are increasingly using property for short-term lets, and as a consequence of the thresholds that have been set with the Small Business Bonus Scheme, paying absolutely no tax towards the City of Edinburgh Council and other councils who provide the essential services upon which their business is based. Presiding officer, if we are interested in investment in a sustainable economy, and if the government is interested in that, the Cabinet Secretary would not have been so enthusiastic in his opening remarks to reel off a list of the A96 and the A9 and the M8 and big bridges, which are supposedly part of that sustainable economy. And whilst we agree with much of the government's economic strategy, including uh, much of the good work it's done on renewables, and John Mason mentioned some of the interesting and fascinating work that's being done across the country that uh, we visited uh, just on, on Monday, it's economic strategy is fundamentally misconceived by having at its core the notion of sustainable economic growth. An economy is not judged by growth. It's judged by how well the people of Scotland are housed. It's judged by how much savings and investments are being made in sustainable technologies. It's judged by the state of the natural environment, the air, the water, the soils and the seas. It's judged by the health of the population. A healthy society is a society in which we should be able to um, reduce spending on the National Health Service, not increase it. And it's judged by the strength of our democracy, particularly local democracy. Presiding officer, the Scottish Green Party has done a lot since its establishment in 1990 to argue that we need a very different economic model. We can begin that within devolved powers, but we cannot fully realise the transformation without fundamental change in how the UK economy is run, from the financialisation of the housing market, its isolationist approach to the Europe, to the rise in public and private debt. Green Amendment highlights these challenges that the Scottish economy faces, and I commend it to members. I call Richard Leonard. Six minutes, please, Mr Leonard. Thanks, Deputy Presiding Officer. It's all very well for the Cabinet Secretary in his opening speech today to declare that our labour market is resilient. He should have a look again at the extent of low pay, of, under, un, of underemployment, of zero-hours contracts in Scotland. Okay. It's true that year-on-year zero-hours contracts are down slightly, but over 50,000 workers in Scotland are still on them. And it is true that the living wage is slightly up in Scotland. But the fact remains that one in five workers in Scotland are paid below the living wage. Many of them low-paid women workers in social care, in contract catering and cleaning and in retail. They are on poverty pay. And it's no good saying that the plight of the working poor is statistically worse in parts of England or Wales. It's no good saying that an additional 2 or 3% of the working poor are surviving in abject poverty in Bridge End than they are in Cope Bridge. There is no crumb of comfort for the people I represent across central Scotland in that. Ivan McKee spoke of limited powers. The Cabinet Secretary chastised his speakers for not having, in his words, original thought. Well, here's an original thought. Why don't you use the powers that you've got? The powers you've got over industrial policy, manufacturing policy, as James Kelly said, taxation policy, planning policy, housing policy, education policy, skills policy, training policy, to start planning the economy. Once again in the debate, we have witnessed complacency rising from the SNP benches and self-congratulation rising from this government motion. A lack of understanding about what is going on out there in the real world. I sometimes wonder if it is a willful lack of understanding or the inevitable consequence of a chauffeur-driven lifestyle. Or maybe it is simply that it is not the political priority of nationalism. The Cabinet Secretary can rhyme off EY attractiveness surveys. But what matters out there in the real world is that wages are being squeezed harder than ever, whilst prices are rising. 
We wake up to headlines that price inflation is now running at 2.9%. Actually, real inflation, including housing costs, the retail price index, now stands at 3.7%, which is why in our amendment we demand a living wage for all, and why I note the Cabinet Secretary in his opening remarks acknowledged the need to remove the cap on public sector pay. On productivity, my message to the government is that people are not commodities or units of production. They are not simply wage earners, they are human beings. So Scottish productivity may have grown, but if it is as a result of cuts in hours, especially in offshore oil and gas and in manufacturing, it represents a pyrrhic victory. I want to say a word or two about investment, which is featured in the government motion. Because on the 11th of April this year, just a few days into the start of the new financial year, an email was sent out to the staff of Scottish Enterprise from Kerry Sharp, the director of the Scottish Investment Bank, in which she warned, and I want to quote her at length because this is what's happening out there in the real world as well. She said, we have insufficient budget to meet anticipated demand for everything we are being asked to consider under enhanced SIB. New investments, the level of follow-on expected, support for FDI. We therefore need to prioritise our funding and people resource, which will ultimately mean us investing in some companies and not others, even when they might be strong investment propositions. As funding this year is more constrained than to date, we will continue to support the pipeline of new investment opportunities, but, she says, this may be at a reduced rate than last year. So the head of the Scottish Government's key agency for industrial investment finds it necessary to warn operational staff in the Scottish Government's key agency for economic development that this government's provision in the teeth of Brexit and in the face of an investment gap which is growing is not to increase but it is to cut funding. This is a damning indictment of a government which claims to be stronger for Scotland. I cannot close without reflecting on two lessons from last week's election. The first is, and I hope the SNP from top to bottom understand this, is that people are saying right across Scotland... Excuse me, could we stop... Sorry, Mr Leonard, could we stop the private conversations across these two benches, please? Thank you. Thanks, Deputy President Officer. The first lesson from last week is that people are saying that they have already given an answer to the question of whether we want a separate Scottish state or not, and the answer is a resounding no. So the government now needs to remove the threat of that second divisive referendum. And the second lesson from last week is that nearly 13 million people voted Labour on a manifesto pledging an extension of public ownership, an end once and for all to the economics of austerity, a shift in power in the direction of working people, a new generation of young people older people, working people, not just voting for a party, but voting for an idea. And it is a platform upon which we can build so that we have an economy working for the people rather than people simply working for the economy. An economy with different priorities, providing people with hope, a vision for a better society, not just a narrow vision of a better Scotland, but the grander vision of a better society for all, underpinned by an economy which is run for the many and not the few. I call Martin Fraser up to seven minutes, please, Mr Fraser. Uh, thank you, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. Well, this has been a wide-ranging debate with the inevitable party and constitutional battle lines being drawn. The background to it is the overall performance of the Scottish economy, an issue we've discussed in this chamber on numerous previous occasions. So we know, as we've heard this again during this debate in the latest quarter, the output of the Scottish economy contracted while it grew and grew strongly across the UK. Over the past 12 months, the economy flatlined in Scotland while it grew at 1.9% across the UK. And while the unemployment rate in Scotland is lower than the UK as a whole, and we, we welcome that progress for the benefit of the Cabinet Secretary, the employment rate is lower and economic activity is higher, as Dean Lockhart reminded us. We are simply not doing as well as we should. And we are still waiting for the Scottish Government's explanation for this state of affairs. The Finance Secretary, who is not here today, previously bl blamed this all on Brexit. And yet surely any Brexit impact would be the same across the whole United Kingdom and not specifically 
look at Scotland. There are surely other issues at stake, and we didn't hear much about that this afternoon from the uh, Scottish National... Oh, yes, of course, I'll go away. Yeah. Keith Brown. Uh, can I thank Mondo Fraser for taking the intervention? I just ask them to consider not uh, my statement or Derek Mackay's statement on this, but the OECD and the IMF, when they say the major risk for the UK economy is the uncertainty surrounding the exit from the EU, which could have damage foreign and domestic investment. Mondo Fraser. I, I, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for, for that point. That doesn't answer my point. Why is it that Scotland alone is seeing a downturn in the economy yeah. that is not affecting other parts of the United Kingdom. If it was only down to Brexit, we'd see that impacted across the whole UK. Now, we know that the Scottish Government doesn't like criticism from these benches or from other opposition benches. So let's look at what some others are saying. And we know that uh, the, the Scottish National Party feels it doesn't have many friends in the media. So I'm not going to quote this afternoon from the Daily Mail or from the Daily Telegraph. I thought I'd quote this afternoon, Deputy Presiding Officer, from the SNP's House Journal, The National. A favourite read of mine, The National, and it said this in an article last month, it said this, and I quote, Since Nicola Sturgeon took over, I'm sorry to say, Scottish economic policy has become a bit of a shambles. She herself appears ignorant of and indifferent to economics. The man who might have looked after these things for her, John Swinney, unwisely shifted himself into the quagmire of Scottish education, where he is in danger of sinking. So the Scottish economic shop is being minded by two men, Derek Mackay and Keith Brown, for whom the term clueless would be a compliment. While factually claiming this, the economy is resilient, they have in fact exposed its fragility. Deputy Presiding Officer, these are cruel and unkind words. I would never use them myself. I am merely quoting directly from uh, Michael Fry, that well-known yes supporter, that well-known supporter of the SNP, writing in the National just the other month. If that's what their friends say about them, Deputy Presiding Officer, are they surprised they get criticism from the other benches? Now, we agree uh, with the Scottish Government that there are a number of strengths to the Scottish economy. There are key sectors, such as energy, such as tourism, such as higher education, where we continue to perform well, although there are challenges. The Scottish Government has set out its four priorities – investment, innovation, internationalisation and inclusiveness. And in all of these, we have a mixed picture. When it comes to investment, we are still doing relatively well in relation to foreign direct investment, although figures are lower than they have been previously. We're down 9 per cent on last year. We continue to struggle to attract migrants to Scotland compared to other parts of the United Kingdom. And educationally, our standards are falling against international competitors. When it comes to innovation, our productivity and I want to make some progress just now, thank you. Our productivity levels lag behind other economies. The Scottish Government have trumpeted, they do this in their motion, the recent increase in productivity compared to the rest of the UK, but according to the Fraser of Allender Institute, this is driven by a reduction in the number of hours worked, not an increase in output per hour. The reality is that we are in the fourth quartile of innovation-driven countries behind those like Norway, Ireland and Sweden, whilst the UK as a whole ranks above them. Our entrepreneurial activity rate is 5.5%, the UK's is 8.6%, and our rate has decreased in Scotland 19% from the previous year, as against a rise of 18% for the UK. So what do we need to do to get it better? Well, first of all, we accept this. We have to get Brexit right. We have to have the maximum possible access to the single market for UK business. That's the very clear position of the 13 Scottish Conservative MPs now in the House of Commons, there to speak up for Scotland and articulate our interests. What is not in the interest of Scotland is to have a differentiated deal for Scotland, no thank you, compared to the rest of the UK. The rest of the UK is by far our biggest market for goods and services, worth four times as much as the EU. To pursue our relationship with the EU at the expense of our relationship with the rest of the UK would be cutting off our nose to spite our face. That is not a road we should go down. And we must keep Scotland competitive, as Alison Harris said, and not have a situation where taxes in Scotland are higher than they are in the rest of the UK. The business community have warned the impact this will have if we go down this particular route. No, thank you. I have no time. Um, if you're trying to attract the brightest and best to come and work in Scotland, where they have to pay more income tax, where they have to pay more to buy a house because of LBTT rates, where businesses with larger premises are paying a business supplement at double the rate those elsewhere in the United Kingdom, that's not going to make Scotland competitive. 
But I was interested to hear Gillian Martin's call for lower taxes. I wish the SNP would make up their mind. Do they want higher taxes in Scotland or are they calling for lower taxes as Gillian Martin was? Presiding officer, above all, no, I'm in the last minute. What we need to see is the Scottish Government rule out a second independence referendum. This was the clearest possible message from last week's general election. Up and down Scotland, people turned against the SNP, which lost 21 seats, lost half a million votes, and saw their vote share fall to just 36%. People across Scotland sending Nicola Sturgeon the clearest possible message. They don't want a second independence referendum. It is this uncertainty which is hampering the ability of the Scottish economy to succeed. My, my friend Liam Kerr, in a Churchillian turn of phrase, you must close said, now, please. uncertainty is a nemesis of investment. He is absolutely right, Deputy Presiding Officer. Let's reject a second independence referendum and get the Scottish economy back on track. I call Keith Brown. Uh, nine minutes, please, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Presiding Officer, in summing up, I welcome the opportunity to respond to some of the points which have been made during the debate and to also further highlight the underlying strengths of Scotland's economy, because let's face it, none of the opposition parties will do that. Uh, I'll start by emphasising, of course, that Scotland's economy is fundamentally strong. We have advantages and resources in Scotland that few nations can match. We have one of the most highly educated workforces in Europe, uh, a long-standing reputation for innovation and an internationally recognised brand. And in a Conservative and Labour denial of the fact that inactivity includes the vastly increased number of people going to higher education is in itself an attack on the very idea uh, of higher education. We are world leaders in key industries of the future, such as life sciences, financial services and financial technology, creative industries and sustainable tourism. And it's important not to diminish these strengths. I agree that you have to acknowledge what the challenges are in the Scottish economy. Much of that has been mentioned uh, during the course of this debate. But you also have to reckon, reckon on the strengths and build on the strengths that we have. Uh, and they're part of the reason that uh, EY attracting the survey has continued to demonstrate that Scotland is the number one location outside of London for foreign direct investment projects into the UK. We do, though, face challenges, not least from the ongoing pressures facing the oil and gas industry. And I think Willie Rennie was completely wrong to say that Paul Whitehouse had blamed the oil and gas industry, but that's Willie Rennie for you. And also, we've had the potentially disastrous impacts of a hard Brexit. Scotland's economy continued to grow in 2016 by 0.4%. However, the slight contraction in the final quarter of 2016 emphasises, of course, there is no room for complacency. And indeed, today's State of the Economy report showed that approximately two-thirds of the slowing in growth between 2014 and 2016 in Scotland can be attributed to impacts in the oil and gas sector. And that's why we continue to provide support to the oil and gas sector directly through measures such as the Energy Jobs Task Force, Transition Training Fund and Decommission Challenging Fund. And it's also why we continue to invest for sustainable and inclusive growth more broadly in our economy. I mentioned a number of the uh, major infrastructure projects. I could also mention the Borders Rail mentioned by uh, John Mason. Uh, of course, a huge investment, nearly three quarters of a billion pounds in the electrification of the Edinburgh to Glasgow uh, Railway. And also the huge investment we made around the country in Scotland's national cycle network as well. But building on those examples, I think we should also mention uh, helping small businesses grow through our small business bonus scheme, which removes the business rates burden entirely from 100,000 premises. Uh, in relation to some of the points which have been made, first of all, in relation to the um, Conservatives, there's been no mention until the very end from Murdo Fraser of record low unemployment in Scotland. Now, of course, this used to be the key criteria on which the Tories judged the performance of the Scottish Government in relation to the economy. It no longer is because it doesn't suit, so they move on to something else. Inactivity is their preferred uh, one today, and I've mentioned the reasons why that is, in many ways, a good response, because that uh, tells us we have more uh, students going into higher education. Uh, and, of course, it's exactly at the point when Scottish unemployment levels dropped below the UK, the Tories thought they'd better not mention that anymore. We'll stay away from that. There's been virtually no mention of Brexit. Uh, Alison Harris's response to deny the impact of Brexit in terms of the Scottish and UK's economy beggars belief. And I've mentioned, I've quoted the figures from the OECD uh, when they say that this is the major impact, the major effect, uh, the major threat facing the UK economy. Uh, the major risk, they say, of the UK uh, uh, economy is the uncertainty surrounding the exit from the EU, which could uh, hamper foreign and direct investment. We also saw the IOD survey immediately after the election 
the shambles that is the UK government just now, immediately afterwards, the hung parliament, a 34% negative swing in the Institute of Directors survey in terms of business confidence. Not a mention, apart from the one I mentioned uh, from the Tories about the impact on Brexit. And they, they're determined to try and deny the fact that Brexit is a, a real and present danger to the Scottish uh, economy. And of course, we don't actually know... Uh, uh, no, I won't. Uh, we don't actually uh, know... Uh, what the Tory position on Brexit is, because we have, we have like a roundabout route. We had no Brexit, we had soft Brexit, we had hard Brexit. We've got something now apparently called open Brexit, but that only lasted for 24 hours before she was told by Theresa May, you'll get behind whatever Brexit that we want to give you. And of course that Brexit, I think it's a Shexit. And I think it's a Shexit because it's the shambles. An absolute disaster. <laughs> You've got no idea what you're doing. You don't even know within a week of going into those discussions with 27 countries lined up ready to negotiate. You've not got a clue what you're going to say to them. That is a danger to the Scottish economy. Yeah, yeah. And Labour bizarrely argued that we shouldn't be liaising with business. Then they said that we should be uh, liaising with business. And of course, the furious, uh, fearless class warrior that's Richard Leonard was too scared to even take an intervention. And he knew, he knew that the reason for that was because James Kelly couldn't answer the question, what is Labour's position on the single market? Nobody knows. There's a John McDonald's position which says, we will not stay in the single market. Well, that seems to be confirmation. They want to come out the single market. We already know they don't support freedom of movement. And that's a disastrous and wrong-headed approach from the Labour Party. And it was mentioned by Jackie Bailey about Scotland's economic strategy, that we have to change. Scotland's economic strategy. Well, it's changed since the last days when the Labour Party were in government, when the Labour's uh, uh, economic strategy was a short and snappy thing. There was only five words in it, which was, there is no money left. That's what the Labour Party left us with. In two now, I will give away to Jackie Bailey. Jackie Bailey. I think people would all agree that Scotland's economic strategy contains many of the things that we would put in it. There has been common agreement about the direction of travel. But faced with Brexit, your own previous head of policy said the strategy has been turned on its head. Why will you not review it? Keith Brown. In addition to that uh, economic strategy that we had of there is no money left, we then have Richard Leonard complaining that there is an insufficient budget. He complains, why do you think there might be an insufficient budget? Do you draw any connection at all with the disastrous management of the economy from the Labour Party? And that's why we've had the seven years of austerity from the Conservatives. Labour started it and you've passed it on to the Conservatives. Now, Willie Rennie obviously forgot what the debate was about when he spoke. He made no mention of the economy at all and the obsession that these parties have with independence. He got himself into a complete and comic fankle when he failed to rescue his hapless new MP, Christine Jordan. Now, Christine Jordan says it's only the Liberal Democrats that are allowed to continue to promote the policies that they stood on in the election. Nobody else is allowed to do it. Not very liberal and not very democratic. It's also true to say that he told totally... I will give way to Willie Rennie. Willie Rennie. Well, he's not afraid to take interventions after all. Now, he mentioned, he mentioned, clear, he mentioned clear and present danger. But the one clear and present danger he has not addressed this afternoon is independence. So is he going to give us an answer about independence? Is he for it or is he against it? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, uh, for those that weren't here during the debate, that was all that Willie Rennie talked about in his opening speech. And that's why he forgot to even mention the Scottish economy. Uh, presiding officer, the biggest threat to Scotland's economy is not uh, what Willie Rennie says it is, it's a hard Brexit. Now, many Conservatives raised uh, the Fraser of Allender Institute. They, they didn't mention the fact that Fraser of Allender says Brexit will cost us 80,000 jobs over a decade. It will cost us billions of pounds and it will cost £2,000 to every employer. None of them mentioned that. There is no concern on the Conservative benches for people working in this country. And it's also the case that they never refused to answer the point of whether they would replace funds left uh, when the EU, EU structural funds are no longer applicable uh, subsequently. They were asked that direct question and they failed to answer it as well. Uh, as, as I said earlier, it's essential the UK government commits to replacing that funding in full following Brexit. Scotland did not for a hard, didn't vote for a hard Brexit. In fact, we didn't vote for a Brexit at all. And the Scottish government will continue to make the case for single market membership. But whatever happens over the coming months, the Scottish government will continue to actively promote and defend the Scottish economy. Presiding officer, I've set out today the Scotland's ec economic fundamentals remain strong, that we are an attractive place for investment and there are opportunities here for growth. The outlook, of course, for 2017 is finally balanced.
past and challenges remain, to, uh, remain in relation to the oil and gas sector and, of course, the prospect of a hard uh, Brexit. But I think we have demonstrated that the Scottish co economy is well placed to meet those challenges. However, we have to continue to invest for sustainable and inclusive uh, growth by promoting and supporting innovation. The Tory record is £1.8 trillion pounds of debt, £100 billion pounds of new debt for every year that they've been in office. They've now got 2.9% 2, 2 unemployment, a massive balance of trade deficit. That's what the Tory record is on the economy. The SNP's record, because the SNP has been getting on with the day job, many people across <laughs> Scotland... I'll just repeat that for them. Uh, because the SNP government's been getting on with the day job, Scots across Scotland can get on with their day job. I support the motion. Thank you. That concludes our debate on Scotland's economy. The next item of business is consideration of Scottish Parliamentary Corporate Body Motion 5575 on membership of the Scottish Commission for Public Audit. Could I call on Andy Whiteman on behalf of the Scottish Parliamentary Corporate Body to move Motion 5575? Formally moved. Thank you very much. The next item of business is consideration of three Scottish SPCB motions on appointment of trustees to the Scottish Parliamentary Contributory Pension Fund. And I call on Dave Stewart, David Stewart, on behalf of the SPCB to move motions 6002 to 6004. Yeah, formally moved on presiding officer. Thank you very much. The next item of business is consideration of business motion 6082 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau setting out a business programme. I would ask anyone who wishes to speak against the motion to say so now. I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to move the motion. Formally moved. Thank you very much. And no one's asked to speak against the motion. The question, therefore, is that we agree motion 6082. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The next item of business is consideration of Parliamentary Bureau motion 6007 on establishment of a private bill committee. And again, I would ask Joe Fitzpatrick to move the motion on behalf of the Bureau. Moved. Thank you very much. And we come now to decision time. So on the first question, I would remind members that if the amendment in the name of Dean Lockhart is agreed, then all the other amendments would fall. The question is that Amendment 6045.1 in the name of Dean Lockhart, which seeks to amend Motion 6045 in the name of Keith Brown and Scotland's economy, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote and members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on the amendment in the name of Dean Lockhart is yes, 27, no, 91. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. The next question is that amendment, sorry, the, the amendment in the name of Jackie Bailey is also preemptive. If it agreed, the amendments in the name of Patrick Harvey and Willie Rennie would fall. The question is that amendment 6045.3 in the name of Jackie Bailey, which seeks to amend the motion in the name of Keith Brown, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Oh. We're not agreed. We'll move to our division and members will cast their votes now. The result of the vote on the amendment in the name of Jackie Bailey is yes, 18, no, 100. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. We turn now, turn now to Patrick Harvey's amendment, which also preempts uh, the amendment in the name of Willie Rennie. The question is that amendment 6045.4 in the name of Patrick Harvey, which seeks to amend motion in the name of Keith Brown, be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. We'll move to division and members may cast their votes now.
The result of the vote on the amendment in the name of Patrick Harvey is yes, six, no, 112. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. The next question is the amendment 6045.2 in the name of Willie Rennie, which seeks to amend the motion in the name of Keith Brown be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. We'll move to a division and members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on the amendment in the name of Willie Rennie is yes, 22, no, 96. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. The next question is that motion 6045 in the name of Keith Brown on Scotland's economy be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a division and members will cast the votes now. The result of the vote on motion 6045 in the name of Keith Brown is yes, 62, no, 56. There were no abstentions. The motion is therefore agreed. The, the next question is that motion 5575 in the name of Andy Whiteman on the membership of the Scottish Commission for Public Audit be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I propose to ask a single question on the three motions relating to the appointment of trustees to the Scottish Parliamentary Contributory Pension Fund. If any member objects, please say so now. The question is that motions 6002 to 6004 in the name of David Stewart be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The final question is that motion 6007 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on the establishment of a private bill committee be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed, and that concludes decision time. <laughs>